Right, this is going to be another episode of Summoning Insight, a.k.a., at least for this week, a show where Monty will not be saying the sentence. It's like I was saying to Dom on Power Spike. No, don't <laughs> say it to Dom on Power Spike. Just say it to me, you know, the original one who came into this game with you. In this metaphor, stop messing around with that floozy who's just been the flavor of the month for the last few years. Come back to your wife. Come back to the one who built this family. Didn't I give you wonderful children? Maui Snake, in some ways, Dom himself. You know, remember, I was the original one cracked out back in the day. The problem That's is, right. though, even Dom, he's grown up into a teenager hasn't he? He's starting to get a bit confident, past the boundaries. Now he only comes back once a month when he needs something, you know, and then I have to do most of the work, but you know, whatever, being a parent, it's a thankless task. It's all right. Well, it's a dark time to be doing the LEC show. Let's put it that way. It is. It is. <laughs> it's probably In some ways, the, the worst does. year. <laughs> No joke, unironically, that has actually probably helped that show that Dom didn't do that weekly because I feel like he would just be losing his mind every week and it would get really yeah. bad. Whereas, because I can cycle people in and out, I can sort of keep it fresh, you know, I can keep them like... <laughs> Keep them, like, not quite on the edge of the cliff, as it were. <laughs> well, maybe after this uh, eSports World Cup and Fanatic's performance, you know, people people will be back on the cliff again. Even G2, obviously, struggling at this event. Sure. Oh, by the way, I also did laugh where I saw when that VOD for Power Spike came out, which obviously has your out instead of mod, which I'm referencing. The title of the VOD, whoever did that, that was actually a Masterclass Rage Bait <laughs> title because the title just starts, why T1 winning doesn't matter. Like, if you think <laughs> any of these T1 fans could resist clicking that, they can't, mate. Like, I'm a, like, you can see as usual, that's actually probably the one good thing in some ways. You know what? In, a, in sort of a WWE, sense Monty it actually is sort of good that T1 won that tournament because otherwise like the whole year would just be all of us dunking on T1 fans all year like, you're fucking idiots so in a way we needed them to like get one mini tournament just so they get they get confident again like you know this Monty it's not as funny when like TSM was just bad like at that point it's like nah, I feel bad for him but you want him to be just on the cusp of being good but lose right so in some ways bear in mind I'm pretty sure they're still going to get absolutely rinsed in this summer and then they're not going to win worlds in some ways it's better we've given them the false hope of EWC it's Especially because, <laughs> you know this, Monty, the joke is the only context in which EWC ever would have mattered is actually this one. It's not even if T1 won, guys. It's if Gen G lost EWC. If Gen yep. G had won EWC, I promise you, every T1 fan would have made all the arguments Monty then made about this isn't part of the circuit. We didn't count IEMs. <laughs> Everyone, all of them would have done that. In fact, they even would have said shit, Monty, like, who cares about EWC? Fake has MSI and Worlds titles. Like, EWC is some side shit. They, they would have, they would have made it. It's like Rift Rivals or something. They'd have done that bullshit, you know? So I love the fact that, like, in the alternate timeline, I get to see that they are all full of shit and now they're all like, Wait, Talk about a great win. That's excellent. Yeah, oh, we beat Mako. Like, give me like, I love it. I love it. Well, I, you know, it is, it is just ridiculous because obviously nobody ever referred to the Golden Road as including like Kespa Cup or Demacia Cup or, yeah. you know, any of the IEMs. Like the the reason no, why no. nobody's, you know, nobody's done it because nobody's won their two domestic split MSI and Worlds in yes. the same year. Um, yes. So I, I think this is really just a moot conversation. But, but, hater, here's why if you're a hater, if you're a Team 1 fan, don't put too much stock in this or it will end up biting you in the arse. One, if they use this format ever in the future again, it's actually the easiest tournament by definition to win that's an international tournament already. Secondly, unless you come first, the results are scuffed because like two Western teams had to make the semis. So already that's some WWE shit. And then finally, I would just say this. As Monty says, if you want to talk about real tournaments, like people like Knight, who you all think suck, I think he's... He's won like a billion Demacia Cups, mate. He might have won it like five times. That was you know what I mean? Like, because it, it's not always the same roster, but they're real tournaments. Sure, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. That's why I put that comment on Twitter to tease people like, hey, if you guys are counting non riot tournaments now, let's have a little revisit of Name's career. Because if people don't know, <laughs> Name in one year in 2014 won more trophies than Luzi's entire career. He won more, <laughs> he won the same amount of LPL as in his entire career and all the other tournaments except one. He's only somewhat like seven or eight because back to back when actually you remember Riot used to let China bizarrely have the LPL, but then also an open circuit. I used to be mad jealous of that, even though eventually over time they made it just to Massey Cup and then like maybe NEST in the off season or whatever. But like they used to actually have like during the whole year, like seven or eight tournaments. It was kind of baller, actually. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh obviously this is ridiculous. Uh it I, I don't know how much we need to go into it because it pains me to even waste time telling people that the golden road is still on oh, of course 
I mean, and, and by the way, this is going to be the narrative, guys. If Genji wins summer, what do you think everybody at Worlds with a microphone yes. is going to be talking about? It's not that nobody gives You're a right, shit actually. what your yeah. opinion is about the Golden Road. No but one no, logically, cares. Logically, they couldn't even acknowledge it, Monty. In the same way as, by the way, we'll get to this in a minute. In the same way as that take, like, they only got 1.1 is so dumb when you consider it. It's not in the client. It's not actually advertised on all the broadcasts. Like, that's actually insane that you can get MSI numbers without any of the advertising, as far as I know. I'm not certain. I, I don't think they did. So if Riot can't acknowledge AWC on their broadcast, Monty, they have to pretend the Golden Road is on. Yeah, the, in fact, the Golden Road yes. can't include it, can it? Logically. <laughs> they have the worlds they can't go. Um, of course, Genji won both splits and MSI, but uh, remember, they did lose that tournament that we can't talk about, so they can't be perfect. They're not going to say that, are they? You're right. They're 100% going to say if they win Worlds, they've completed the Grand Slam or whatever. Yeah, and, and we are... should. Like, that's something I actually do hope. They fucked it up last year, Monty. This year, win or lose, it's like when you do the Super Bowl, you have to print the T-shirt that says, like, Buffalo Bills, 1991 champions, whether you lose or not, just in case you win. Prepare a fucking feature for Worlds if Gen.G wins summer. That is about, are they going to do the Grand Slam? You must do that. Like, the idea they didn't do that with JDG, I think it's mental last year, mate. Like, <laughs> that's a must, because it'll be so epic if you do, if you get it right, as it were, you set that storyline up, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I think they probably learned, hopefully, from their mistakes right. last year around JDG. And, you know, at least on the English language broadcast, the, the LCK teams are more popular. So I think there'll be more people talking about it. Right. All right sure. The thing about LPL is a lot of the fans just ignore, you know, they ignore the league until those teams come to international events. So they're definitely people are not as much on the have their finger on the pulse of the narratives of that league in the Golden Road. So I think it'll be much more much more prevalent this year. Um, but before we do that, Thorne, I want to talk about esports World Cup because there's been a lot of people saying that this was some sort of failure. Which is That's very... what I'm saying. We need to. If people don't know, by the way, Monty, what happened was there was a tweet. It was just from some random person. I don't think he was even a famous person. And they said something along the lines of they revealed that the tournament had 1.1 million viewers. Yes. I'm assuming he means like max viewers at one point Peak. in time or something yes, like that. For, you know? for T1 yeah. top. Not including Chinese then, viewers. 1.1 million. Right. Not including Chinese viewers. Very key. To and then that. the bizarre thing is, as opposed to just reporting the fact, then giving his opinion, he then even himself put it in context, but then gave what, as far as I can tell, is the opposite analysis of the context. So he then said in the tweet, like, this is like essentially implied it was failure and said this is the lowest international tournament, like since MSI 2018. And then what's bizarre is loads of people I saw who were pretty legit, like you and others, came in and were seeing all the obvious rebuttals. But then bizarrely, we'll get to this in a minute, like Jacob Wolf just took his framing. And all I'll say is the original <laughs> tweet has now been deleted, by the way. I think the original guy even realized he was getting donked on. He was just wrong. So yeah, go on, give me your thoughts. Because obviously the, the framing of that is mental. Like, as far as I can tell, Monty, that's like my joke is, you remember after that first re recent presidential election where Biden came off really badly and even all people on like the left were also the debate. pushed up yeah, down. Yeah. There was there was a headline that was put out after this where it said something like, you know, like he, he didn't lose anything except potentially the vote or something. And it's like that framing is mental because the vote's everything in an election. So the joke is it's the same thing. It's like basically, aside from the viewers though, Monty, like they're basically trash and they, and they failed. And it's like, because when I see that, like, bro, 2018 MSI, like that's, that's a big up. That's a, that's props for a 4 yeah. tournament let's, no one's ever heard of. Out nowhere. Yeah, let, do it. Let's, do let's it. talk about this, the framing of this event. Because in my expert opinion about tournament viewership, this is a really good result it's for incredible. the Esports World Cup. Like a very it's good incredible. result. Monty, um, you might not know this. A lot of people don't. But in Counter-Strike, you know what I always say? I think I am Katowice in Cologne, which once upon a time were majors, but they haven't been for years now. You know, I always say, I actually think they're better tournaments than the major. They have, by the way, they have all the same sure, teams yeah, that yeah. look better because they invite off a ranking. Yeah, better, they have a better format. format. It yep. doesn't matter, Monty, how good that tournament is. It never gets close to the viewership of like a major. The major automatically will probably usually be like yes. double, maybe sometimes more. Like, so to me, like, that's why I'm saying if you know esports, I think this guy completely misframed it. This is a really good result for the fucking nation event. Like, what the fuck? It, it's the first <laughs> time this event happened. There wasn't any kind of market. Let me tell you the marketing that I saw. There were Twitter ads that I saw for this event, and yep. there were Twitch ads. So if you were watching Twitch, sometimes you got a pre roll advertisement. All right you know, that had Esports World Cup, but it wasn't specifically about League of Legends. It was about, like, the the event yeah. as a whole. Um, so they didn't target... Dude, you know, as I alluded to, I'm pretty sure no regional broadcast mentioned it. They all had to just pretend it. We're off next yep. week, guys. It's yep. like you had to just not... Yeah, that was even worse. I think, well, that's half the fucking reason you know what's going on. Theory. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it is worth noting that, like, English language viewership of this event was not mega. Like, the biggest okay. streams that we know of 
that are non-Chinese are Korean streams. So the Korean audience oh. definitely watched that. And let me tell you guys, if the Korean streams are the biggest streams, this event started daily at midnight Korean time. Ooh. So it and that's 11 p.m. Chinese time. So for the Asian regions, oh, to then top viewership is actually kind of crazy because you know the second best of three would be starting at like 3 a.m. Korean time. Monty, so here's an angle no one's thought about. Here's an angle no one's thought about, bro. Let me know which MSI or Worlds was ever held in the Middle East. Are we just going to ignore that? Are we acting like, dude, we're at, we're taking the number as a static number yeah. and genuinely comparing it to all others. Whereas, like, for example, like, so essentially, Monty, what that guy also was saying is, you won't believe this, but, like, actual uh, Worlds held in Korea had higher viewership than an EWC no one knew about taking place in the Middle East. It's like, what? really? <laughs> really? <laughs> like, that's not even shocking. When I frame it that way, it's fucking, I, I agree with you, Monty. The more context you put in, I don't even like the Saudis, but this is, they actually fucking killed it. They did, and they did a better job than I thought, mate. I would have thought it would be low view. Personally. I mean, the production was good. You know, we 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 obviously didn't love the format, but they got the best teams. It was very fortunate that T1 agreed to go because T and that T1 yes. made the finals. Obviously, that's going to draw a huge amount. Almost the viewership. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, like, there were yes. there were circumstances. Like, if Gen G was in this final, if it was Gen G, you know, versus oh, BLG. Less. There would be fewer yes. viewers probably, but yes. that didn't. That isn't what happened. We got the full Faker run through the gauntlet, um, and. We ended up with, it's not only 1.1 million peak concurrent viewers, again, not counting Chinese viewers, but it was 500,000 average viewers, which is still really good. And by the way, that's much higher than really any domestic league out there. It's higher than the LEC's average viewership. Um, it's higher than LCK's average viewership. Now, obviously, LCK has a lot more games and a lot more bad games. But honestly, to get that high viewership over, what, six best of threes and one best of five? is really very successful. Like, I think no one on the Esports World Cup ESL side looks at this event and thinks, wow, this was really shitty. And not only that, but the production quality was generally very good. Um, you know, they had a lot of, you know, there was a there was downtime and there were, you know, audio issues and stuff and there were pauses, but they had enough casters to like fill those pauses relatively well. Oh, yeah. It's not it's not anything we're not used to because League of Legends has pauses all the time for every single possible reason in every single league and every single international event. So, you know, if I'm looking at this from a Riot perspective or if I'm looking at this from an ESL perspective, I'm very happy with how this event went. And like what I hate, look, I call out the LCS because the LCS posts numbers that are full of shit and then willfully misinterprets them. So right. I'm going to do the opposite here and say that people are willfully misinterpreting these esports World Cup yes. numbers as being bad. And in Jacob Wolf's case, outright lying. It, because he says, League esports are having an all-time low interest, which is fucking insane to say. Tell me you don't watch Asian League of Legends, yeah. <laughs> it's not even Asian League of Legends, Thorin. The last MSI and the last Worlds broke viewership oh, records. Oh, sure. They, yeah, they did. The they international liked. events have been yep. popping off. The last LCK final had the highest viewership in LCK history. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there was enormous interest. If we're talking about LCK... Shout out Jacob Wolf for doing the classic American chauvinism and essentially already talk about the LCS book conflict with the whole world. Well done, well, Matt. Well done. Well, you also, I mean, even LEC <laughs> domestically was up, like, almost 30% year over year from last year. Now, well, is a lot of that because of Ibai and Kometo and, yeah, sure. of course. I mean, corporate, yeah, but but the number like to say it has an all time low numbers, interest yeah. is just fucking incorrect. Yes. You can you can I, I don't like the way that they fudged those numbers in LCS and they propped it up with a bunch of Europeans and Brazilians. But it is true that LCS grew over last summer. The audience, the number of viewers on the whole did increase. That is a true statement. Does it need context? Yes. But it is so wrong to say that. League of Legends interest is at an all-time low. It, it's just not and you know, right. The, you know, the dumbest thing about it is, look, here's what's funny. You might think, why are we bring up Jacob Wolf? One, he claims he doesn't even really do esports stuff anymore. And two, he hasn't really done much in League for years at this point in time, right? He's just sort of been a general esports report. But first of all, he literally was an award winner at that role. So he's considered a, a very respected, decorated figure within the esports space. And then also, I'm, I'm just going to say this quite right now, Monty. It's one thing. Look, everyone on Twitter can just sometimes be given their opinion. Not everything's a report or a piece of work. 
But I do think if you're going to do a job like that, when it comes to certain topics, and I think finance is a big one, Monty, because at the end of the day, our industry does to some degree live or die off like fucking investor confidence and whether they think like the numbers are real or the numbers are going up or going down. Like that is a big factor as to like where they, and so someone like Jacob Wolf actually can be like a fucking bellwether type guy. You know, he can be a guy that makes people think one way or another. And the problem I had with his framing was, it was right there in the first tweets, is it was so obviously motivated by wanting to say, start smashing is bad and it doesn't work anyway. Look at me, I am saying it is bad. No, but even then it was dumb because notice his understanding of sports washing Monty is, you're paying people to watch and then say you're good. Dumbass, you are the guy, again, who is still annoying Richard Lewis, saying a game can't be fixed because they didn't pay all of the losing team to throw the whole match. And it's like, that hasn't been on match fixing worked in a decade. Like, match fixing works by things like you lose one map out of three, but you can still win it, or you lose an upper bracket match, then you win the low one, or you just do some the equivalent of the throwing in soccer. You just do, like, you know, you lose a certain fourth round, you lose a pistol round. That's how you've done match fixing for years, right? So similarly, Jacob Wolf, as far as I can tell, doesn't know what's Sports washing is. Here's what sports washing is, dumb fuck. Sports washing is when you get all these giant orgs like this, the biggest orgs in the world, and because you're bringing them to a tournament, it doesn't matter what the viewership is, they will never criticize Saudi Arabia's human yes. rights record. That is what they bought. And you know what, Jacob Wolf? They 100% won that one. Does yep. anyone even know a single major org that's ever spoken out against this and said openly, like twists from fucking um, uh, Team Liquid and CS, like, I don't want to be involved with that shit. Does anyone know an org that's done that? I'm not aware of a single org in the world. So as far as I can tell, one, you don't understand what sports rushing is. Two, they killed it on these viewership. And by the way, dumb fuck, if it's if if it's actually MSI next year instead of EWC, that take is going to age very it badly. Is. Because the sports we'll rushing is going to break records. Like, bro, here's what this idiot hasn't thought about. Imagine next year, EWC just is MSI, Monty. And so all the, another thing you'll probably do is probably you will put it at different hours to make it work for the Asian regions, right? Yes. Then what happens is you have a better format because it's MSI and the MSI, you ready? You have a five like we've had all these years, you have something like the dream obviously is like T1 or Gen G versus BLG or JDG or Top Esports, right? If you get one of those finals, you are going to, the joke is within a year, the Saudis will have like the highest rated tournament ever in League of Legends yep. history. At which point, what the fuck are you going to say, bro? Because that's going to age so poorly. <laughs> it's almost well, a short they're going to succeed now, mate, because they're only going to level the event up at this point. Yeah, so let, let's get into, let's get into uh, some Things that are coming up, some things that were said by Riot that were objectively lies about this event and their support <laughs> okay. of it, okay. which are, of course, very Riot-esque to just publicly lie and then do the exact opposite of what they're saying uh, and what the future is. And I will put on my tinfoil yeah. hat and then offer some theories. Uh, I think so, I know what theory you're going to come up with. It's going to be I've about got, 10 no, I've got, so I've got, I've got, split, I've got one you, you, haven't, you don't oh, know okay. about yet. Um, okay. But let's talk about the objective lies about this event. So if you guys go to their post that they made about this on March 30th, when it was announced that this event was taking place and they were trying to do PR damage control, it's on the Riot Games website. By the way, Thor, and I don't know if you know this, but they actually surreptitiously deleted from the LOL Esports website their uh, pull their statement pulling Someone out of the this. neon deal. Yeah. It's gone yep. now, guys. The link is entirely yep. gone. They deleted it from their website. Weird that. Um, all right. So it says advancing the esports yeah, and player. 1984 and shit, mate. Like mem room 101. In, they, like, they memory hold. You they, re they memory we, hold their, we, their we, own we abandonment. Of the we, have, we have always been on the side of Saudi Arabia. Like, yeah, it's yeah. man. This is so wild, isn't it? <laughs> they literally deleted it. So, uh, <laughs> It says advancing the esports and players experience in Amina, which is Middle East, North Africa, guys. So let me read this sentence to you. The EWC is not an official LOL esports event. Riot will not be involved in the production and Riot will not select the teams that compete. So I will just tell you right now, Riot was involved in the production of this event in the following ways, some of which you can just use your eyeballs for. If you looked at the the overlay in the API, they gave them the LCS, the new LCS overlay with the yellow yeah. numbers. 
They provided them production resources, helped them plug it into the API so that you would be able to see gold differences. That is technology that has been developed for use in different regions that ESL, let me be very clear, does not have. And they didn't even try and mask it because it looks exactly like the LCS overlay. They changed yeah. the graphical elements of it. But on the UI itself, that comes from the LCS. So that was definitely given to them by Riot HQ. So that's a lie. Now, I mean, if obviously, anything, they'd be mad if you did it without their permission, surely. It's like yep. him. You know what I mean? You almost That's almost certain they could sign off, if not just gave you it. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm with you, mate. So they, they did. They were involved in the production. They were also clearly involved by giving the teams and the tournament access to the tournament realm. Now, what does the tournament realm require? Yeah. It requires network engineers to be on call and sitting there so that things don't break. So they were actually providing resources. Now, it's possible that, you know, they charged... EU Sports World Cup for the time of the people that need to run the tournament realm, but they were providing resources. It was very clearly not played on the live servers. Um, so there's another one for you. And here's one from behind the scene, guys. I can tell you straight up that they had a talent blacklist for this event. So Riot told ESL that they could not hire a variety of people to appear as talent on the Esports World Cup behind the scenes, which means that they were categorically involved in the production of this event. So when you say when you say lies. that, by the way, just just so people aren't idiots, you don't mean they helped the LEC staff and banned them all from attending. You mean like actual people that Riot just doesn't allow on their broadcasts, like certain figures you could guess, <laughs> right? That have been acrimonious. Like the Joe kids, if you still casted, you'd have been on that list. Yeah, I, I'm sure I was on that list regardless, Thorin. Um, but there were. Many people on Well, here's the reason, Monty, why that's even more significant than maybe even you remember, is people like Monty and others who were blacklists, like I could have done it in theory, have done IEMs when they weren't working with riots. Like Riot allowed that, even though that was another event where I had like a partnership. So they allowed that. So the joke is, that's an event they openly partnered with ESL on to work on IEM. Now they pretend we're not doing anything. Oh, by the way, ban all these people because we don't work with these people. What do you mean? I'm doing this. Yes, yes. You're with us and we don't work with you. Like, bro, you've given the whole game away. <laughs> and when it says they're not, it says Riot will not be involved in the production. They were. They were dictating yes. terms and they were providing resources. They absolutely 1000% were involved in the production of Esports World Cup. So they just lied uh, on their post. This was not a hands off event. They definitely had a bunch of people that had provided things for it and they were dictating the terms of that event. Um, and, you know, it's just going to continue. So also, guys, just so you know. Basically, as we suspected, in July of next year, this event will be coming back. Remember what we said previously, what Riot said is they want to move to the three split system and they want to have an international tournament that is a fearless draft that features the top team from all the major regions, um, all the five major regions, because they're combining, uh, you know, Japan and Oceania and uh uh, the Taiwanese teams into uh, the um, the like Pacific region. If people don't know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the the new Americas region that isn't done yet, but because I, who knows what business things have to be done behind the sure. scene, but is what they want to do. They've 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 sketched out the broad strokes. So there's going to be that event, and then there's going to be MSI. Now, as we pointed out when they when they issued their roadmap, Thorin, they said very suspiciously that MSI was going to be moved into early July, which coincidentally is the time where Riot has a company-wide vacation and is the start of the Esports World Cup. But I am here to tell you right now, that is definitely happening. And it has to be. It is definitely you happening. You could just be running the tournament without that. How could you do it? <laughs> Thorin, I don't know if they're going to try and spin it. So the spin might be okay. that they stop calling it MSI because it's no longer in mid-season. And they rebranded yeah. as the Esports World Cup. But functionally, it is going to be the format of MSI that we have right now. And it will be played in Riyadh at the Re Esports World Cup. Um, and sure. Thorin, by the way, once it goes there, I don't know if it's ever leaving Riyadh ever again, by Why the way. Why so yeah. if you guys have been excited potentially about MSI coming to your region, those days may, might also be over because it's going to by get way, eaten everyone. by the Esports World Cup event that they want to host there every year. 
there's an obvious reason, Monty, as to why I agree. Once this becomes their event, it never stops being their event. If anything, yep. you go the other way and all of the league circuit, like all the international to all worlds, LEC, all becomes theirs. And this is why. Because one, in doing so, right, they already have said, and this is mainly from a Counter-Strike perspective, so it's more like Richard Lewis's work I'm referencing here. They've basically internally said they, they want it to be where teams do boot camps in Saudi Arabia and this sort of becomes yep. a hard That's all the whole Kadia thing that yeah. they're building. And the, so the, the idea facilities. is... Like, here's the difference. Like, obviously, in Counter-Strike, you have tournaments around the world anyway. If MSI becomes a permanent stop, then logically, you'll go there for your boot camp too, and everyone will go yes. there. That way, we'll all have yep. to be in Korea. And eventually, the obvious angle, which is the thing I thought you were going to reference earlier, is to me... Uh, the other, this is also how Riot kills the problem of like, what about the costs and the viewership? You just fucking have, you have them pay you to run the event. That's you, why you they get them it. to pay you money and then they run the event and white label it for you. You can still even yep. call it all Riot shit. And at the end yep. of this, by the way, the other angle people probably don't know, but it's just an obvious one I've heard a lot of people speculate about is in light of that whole TikTok ban scenario where they're like, we can't allow China to influence. Well, the obvious thing people have even said in esports is, but well, what about Tencent? At one point, Tencent did own Riot 100%. So the other thing people are speculating is if you were to do a similar thing to Tencent and say you have to di you know divest some ownership, well, I wonder which group would love to come in and buy up part of League of Legends that yep. or Riot Games so they can have VCT. And by the way, this is what I'm going to plant the seed for right now because if this happens in two years, it'll be sick. This is where all you virtue signalers, you are just done. It's not even like you can just pretend this isn't happening. When fucking Riot Valorant game changes, think what that tournament is, is owned by the Saudis. It is fucking game over. <laughs> for you my son it's over for you it will be the most absurd which, premise maybe ever which, you know what i mean <laughs> i do i do believe we are on the road to the saudis Why owning not? either all or yeah. part of riot games i do believe we are on that road yeah um based on things that i know uh it seems like that is what's coming yeah. um We'll see if it ends up happening, but I would brace yourself for that one. Let's put it that way. Um, the other yes. thing, the other thing, and here's my other theory, Thorin, and I think you'll like this one, is that Riot also said that they want to open up for other. This is in the same article about Riyadh. As we look toward the future of esports competition, we see international third party events playing a bigger role, much like they did in the early days of League. Yeah, which is great. We we like third party international events, so I got my I got to thinking. Hey, um, I wonder when this first international event could possibly be Thorin. And then I thought, well, the format that they announced is a tournament that's happening in an individual region to start off the year. Where have I seen that before? Oh yeah, LCS lock in. So I thought to myself, how long does LCS lock in take? It took two weeks last time it was held in 2022. And then I thought to myself, well, the league, the league season usually starts in the middle of January and LCS lock-in ended on January 30th, the last time it happens. What Can, can you remind me which event in Counter-Strike starts in the first week of February? Every oh, year? Katowice. I am Katowice. Do you know what used to be at I am Katowice? League of Legends. Yeah. So now, Thorin, I am thinking that that is event because remember it's only supposed to be a week long oh yeah it's by the way for people who don't know it was very popular like i can tell you in the earliest majors in cs they were like the side event monty they only had like a third of the arena or something the rest was all league so it would also be very popular too i think and it only takes a week they've only said that they want to give yeah. just a single week to running that first international event only five teams yeah. on site makes sense so if i had to guess guys i would think that they will be running a format similar if not identical right. to lcs lock-in start in mid-January when the league calendar typically starts and then possibly run that event at IEM Katowice because they've already set it up here that they want more international third-party events. And Thorin, you know what this means is that they, Riot Games Esports, now removes the cost of running MSI. They remove the cost of running this other international event. And now all of a sudden, the only cost they have is worlds. And you know what this means is a larger share of money in their global revenue pool, most likely to divide amongst the teams, which has been their goal. Because remember, Riot has failed at helping the teams monetize. They have failed at in-game itemization. They have failed okay. to create the platform that they said they were going yeah. to do. They have failed at selling media rights. They have failed in every conceivable aspect. And instead of doing what should be done in providing some level of transparency about the marketing success of esports and the sales success of esports, 
they will simply do these things instead. They are going to cut their own costs. And so it would well, not shock me at all. Yeah. It, it does. It makes perfect financial yeah. sense. You, They get to oh, have and the And also remember, it's not, here's the other thing people will forget, Monty. AWC was a limited format. So people, I think some people still forget it's ESL. Dude, ESL might even be the best company in the world at doing big events. Like they just yep, do so true. many. So it's not, it's not like you're giving us someone incompetent and they're going to fuck it up. Like when they did the first game as it, it wasn't that great or whatever. Like this actually, if it's IAM kind of it, it'll also be a banger event. It'll be really well run, I'm sure. Sure. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't think Esports World Cup was a bad event as a viewer. Oh, it was fine. It was, it was fine. fine. So, you know, I, I think from the, the viewership perspective and everything like that, from the experience perspective, we are going to get more of these events. And I think that this is just a slow roll. And I think this is where it's going to start. Like, I know it's going to start with MSI or whatever they fucking call MSI, because Riot just might. The, the thing Riot will probably do is be like, it's not MSI anymore because it's not the midseason. It's just the Esports World Cup. It's happening every year. Goodbye. And then just claim they're not, not doing anything with it. it. You even just do it like a bit like Daughter or something. You just call it like, you know, the Riyadh Masters or something. Yeah, yeah. There's a way you just rebrand it that sounds cool. <laughs> you just rebrand it. Because, you know, way, you know it, it was never an invitational and now it's not going to be oh, midseason exactly. ever. So, like, you can get rid of that yes. name. It's irrelevant. Yes. By the way, I actually have an angle. A lot of people won't have seen it. It's just a piece of news that, in theory, is unrelated that flashed across my timeline. I looked it up. And there's a bunch of people reported it. This is glorious, Monty. This is where what I love about the give the virtue signaling into give me the bloodstained money bag pipeline is people think it's just a very short pipeline. You go from like a virtue signal, I get the bag and that's the end of the story. No, no, no. Because what if the bag every year you pick it up gets more and more bloodstained and more and more bloodstained and eventually you just like. But you're in for a penny and for a pound. So the news I saw, maybe you saw it, was as part of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, the West and the NATO countries, to try and, as a form of sanction against Russia, seized a bunch of their assets. They got a load of money, like sure, there's hundreds yeah. of millions in foreign banks of citizens and oligarchs and all those people, and they just seized it. And they basically said, this is right at the beginning of the war even, like, essentially, we're just going to take this. Like, And to me, it was obviously, like, a, even though it's kind of fucked up, it's obviously another form of sanction. What you're saying is, right, we're going to cut off some of your access to money. Yes. So that again, your economy's strangled and you have to eventually give up or come to the negotiation table, right? This is insane, Monty. Because Saudi Arabia, through that BRICS system, which they're trying to make like a rival sort of a NATO or G7-esque thing, because that BRICS thing contains Saudi Arabia and Russia, the announcement from Saudi Arabia was that basically, if these Western pay countries stay seize Russia's assets of something like $300 million, then they're going to actually like get rid of their like EU securities that they've invested in from Saudi Arabia. So Jesus. think about what you're doing now, Monty. Now, when you work with the Saudis, think about virtue signalers. You're, you're knocking off two of them at once. You're getting the gears you claim to love, and you're in, in, indirectly helping Russia have a better position in the war effort. Oh, my God, your Twitter has aged badly the last three or four years, guys. It's fucking wild, isn't it? And that's not even any... I haven't given a single opinion there. Like, that's just what's <laughs> going on. So all I'm going to say is this is why, by the way, I do think that the actual angle... You notice, Monty, I've actually won that war with the Carlos thing. No one references Carlos or Andrew Tate ever again. Have you noticed that? No famous person ever references it now. And the reason why is this. Remember how they framed it, Monty? They framed it as to even mention Andrew Tate could indirectly cause harm in air quotes to like all young men in the West or something mental, right? Well, if you think that's fucking really like big time shit, well, then there's no way you can be involved with people like shifting the fucking balance of power in wars and how people are funded. Like, bro, this is insane that you guys took that stand. Like, what a stupid hill to die on. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I think like there... I don't mind people calling out repugnant behavior, but like when it stops, when the real shit comes along, that's when it starts to get gross. Um, no, it's like that famous saying Warren Buffett had. It's only when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Yeah. It's a bag of quote. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't know. It's this whole thing is just, unfortunately, like this is just the reality we live in now. And like a lot of the people, if the equivalent of MSI, because it's not going to just be one week in Saudi Arabia next year, guys, it's going to be the full like three week, one month shebang. And also I'm just going to put this out there. Objectively, the time zone that Riyadh is in is actually very good. They scheduled it at a bad time this time, yes. but the European time zone is the best time zone to run League yes. of Legends out of because you can run it in the middle of the day in Europe and it's early. Launch time, it's, it's more morning yeah. if you do it at 2 yes. p.m 
It's six hours behind Seoul, five hours behind China. So it's like yep. 8 p.m. in Korea, which is a totally fine time to run it. The whole world, it? And, yeah. and, and like on the east coast of America, where most of the population lives, it's like in the early morning. But it's actually fucking kind of doable if you wake up early. Um, and but especially if you if you schedule, you know, the, the N.A. matches at like 5 p.m. in Riyadh, it's like very doable for the U.S. Um, so, you know, it is. The, the European time zone, when they have run the events out of Europe, because it's one hour ahead of Central European time, which is the time in Germany. So it's one hour ahead of LEC. And it is very, very good uh, for them to run a, an international tournament out of when it comes to normal times there, workable times there when people are awake and maximizing viewership across the world. By the way, you know, the thing I do love the best is... With the way my mind works, because I have a good memory, I have a very holistic view of a lot of topics. So the one thing that does drive me crazy is when I look at the minutiae, it doesn't add up on the bigger picture. It's just jarring. So one of the things I can't handle, Monty, is it's not even an old thing from Riot like this. To this day, it was only like, what, a month ago that that woman put that video out where she was like in Valorant, I think it was actually. She was like talking about how, again, they're going to make people better humans, you know, by not letting them swear and be rude to women, right? Think how absurd Riot Games is, guys. They will actually ban you on or suspend you in the game for typing GG easy at the end of the game. But then if one of their business partners just executes people, they go like, sorry, I'm focused on the game. What, 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 what they did? What? Like these people are well, so mental. It's well, so I, I, here's, I think it's a crazy idea, Riot. Why don't you make the Saudis better? If you're going to make humans better, go for it. Just fucking have, go hog wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think what's so crazy about that Valorant thing. And if you guys don't know, so basically there was an Australian female streamer who recorded some Valorant voice yep. comms of a man, you know, saying some, basically like saying he was going to rape her and do other yeah, really messed up. It was very up, bad. Yeah. Like let's, it was horrible. Yep. Um, but what happened is this then got passed around the internet and it got the attention of the lead producer, I believe. Uh, her name is Anna Donlon, I think. She's the lead okay. producer on Valorant who then, you know, made a bunch of public statements about making the game safer for women. So you cannot have Valorant in Saudi Arabia after that if you actually care about the safety and, and yes. you know, women's rights. Like you can't. Yep. So, I mean, the, the whole thing is just ridiculous. Like Riot and the, the employees there can't select the values that they actually have. Also, yes. Thorin, I went and looked at the Riot employees, not the casters, like literally the employees who are publicly treat, tweeting about the Neom deal, radio silence on the event actually being held in Saudi Arabia with the Saudi Arabian government paying Riot money, we presume, for the license fees, and we'll just wait to see when MSI either is there or no longer exists and gets replaced, but is exactly like MSI with a different name. This is why, by the way, the virtue signaling is so dumb, because what that shows is, think about the two scenarios we just described. What that shows is there was literally, in all definitions, nothing brave about calling out Andrew Tate and Carlos. It didn't affect your bottom line. No fan ever turned against, except idiots. Like, I'm sure a few idiots did. Who gives a fuck? You know, essentially, there was no consequence to that. But when there's any of those consequences, financial, political, can you work, etc., suddenly no one's brave. No one's a hero anymore. That's why I always say, the sad thing about this is, I already knew this, not because I'm cynical, just because I know people, I've sort of learned over time, I've tried to anthropologically view people, is everyone does that thing, Monty. I've always said this famous example. You know the very famous example where there's a picture of like a Nazi German crowd and all of them are doing the Heil Hitler, the Roman salute, but there's one guy and he has his arms folded like this, right? And everyone in history, there's so many memes that are just like, be this guy, you know, you would have been, and they all believe in their mind they would be that guy. But the joke is, in this scenario Monty they won't even get like killed or police attack them or put into a prison nope. all they'll get is they can't do uh, one video the moment what one video tournament in Saudi Arabia and that's enough to silence them already they <laughs> so what that proves is you would never be that guy guys in this logic if they were going to actually kill you in real life you would say nothing in fact worse I'm going to go one further you to put your arm up too that's what this proves well, I know it's a I, mad I, fucking it's an extreme example, but you know I, I also just I think in spirit. No, no, no. I think it's a I think it's a apropos, right? And I think what's so interesting to me is that even Riot's employees haven't quite they're so afraid and they still want to fall in line. Like surely there is a way to short circuit Riot games off of this by just coming out publicly yeah. and saying this is nonsense. Because if Riot tells you to be quiet, all you have to say is I thought we had these values at Riot Games and then I'll like, give you the obvious angle. 
it would be women. Think about this, Monty. Remember yeah. what they did after the lawsuit? They held that big protest where they had like a day where they didn't work or whatever, didn't they? They all like sat. Did it, was it like a sit-in or some shit like that? It was one of those ones where they did that. Spoiler, you know all those women? By the way, you all got millions from Riot. You've even actually had some cash. Why don't you do the same thing? Why don't you have a day where you boycott right before the Esports World Cup starts? Say, hey, look how they treat women here. We won't stand for this. Instead, what you actually showed is, and this is mental, you yourself, a woman working for Riot Games, as long as you can have a job at Riot Games, won't speak out against fucked up things happening to women. Spoiler, you just became Riot Games, you dickhead. You became the people who did that to you. You're now part of that. That's how fucked well, up this all is. It's also that I just I just don't understand how Riot would actually punish them in this scenario because oh, they've they? be they so espoused to have. Yes. So like, but, yes. but my point is the people are so afraid they're not even willing to try. That's how afraid no, they no. are. But I, mean, I think I'll you absolutely say, could do the, it. The, I'll give you the contrast, Monty. There are loads of people right now, whatever you think about any of the sides or the situation, there are loads of people in America, especially young people, who have potentially caused themselves a lot of heartache overall, like Palestine protests, etc. That is going on to this day in universities, companies, there's sure. people doing all sorts of, like, there's not even a sniff of that in this. Because I'm with you, by the way, Monty. I actually think it would be a checkmate against Riot. Because one, that's why it has to be the women, Monty. Because they've already had the fucking lawsuit. They can't seem like they're against their female employees. <laughs> and then secondly, surely if you then go against those people and fight them, that becomes like more than an esports story. That can that can go viral. By the way, that's where all those Kotaku dickheads will be all over that story. So that I think that would be the worst PR ever. In a fucked up way, look, you couldn't have probably stopped the event, but you could have undercut massively a lot of the like silence and the conspiracy silence if people had come out and had some sort of like figurehead who'd said something or like if there's just been a sentiment that makes people uncomfortable because I don't, I don't know about you, Monty, but actually it's not the public statements. It's not the deals. It's not even having the event there. The thing that has actually shocked me the most to my Core, is to discover that even behind closed doors, when no one's seeing it, and it's only you and your boss or people in the Rainbow Road, even their people are like cocking and they can't even speak their mind there and really That's the craziest part because the joke is this does become almost psychologically like what happens to people under a totalitarian regime. You're not even allowed to think the negative thought or yeah. ever express it. You eventually self-censor yourself instead of, like I've always said the famous thing about LEC is people will joke like, they can't say this on LEC. It's like, no, no, the joke is LEC has done such a good job controlling the consciousness of their casters. They wouldn't even think to say that. They would already know before they say it, this could get me fired. So they don't say it ever. And as a result, it's the fact there isn't a conversation is why you know it's fucked up. So yeah, oh, it's crazy, isn't it? There's not, there's yeah. actually literally, essentially, and remember all those fuckers on Twitter like six years ago, Monty, like, I am the resistance against Donald Trump. Where's the resistance against this Saudi shit? There's none. The joke is the resistance is Richard Lewis. Like, as far as I can tell, he is just like, he's like Morpheus in the fucking resistance of this, isn't it? Like, he's breaking people up one at a time, you know? You have to shoot. So, guess what, Monty? That's even a good analogy. Remember in The Matrix, they say yeah. about how the agents can just morph into anyone in the system and, the, and all people yeah. fight to protect the system. It's the same fucking metaphor. Well, you know what? You know what I don't understand, Thorin, about all of this is like, regardless of what we may think of many of the individuals who are over at ESL, they have been some of the OGs of esports, and they have, you know, in many ways shared up until this point, I thought, shared values that we had about the esports Gosh. infrastructure, a love of the scene since when it was grassroots. And like what's so confusing to me about and it really got to me like watching this tournament was like, why? Why is this necessary? Why are all of these people that I know willingly doing this? Because nobody like if you literally went back five years in time and told people that this was going to be the result, no one would have wanted this. Oh, they'd laugh in your face, man. No, but it's not even that they would find it ridiculous. It's that they would say, no, I don't want esports to be oh, that sure. way. And yet now, because it's just happened iteratively, they just do it. And what I also don't understand, Thorne, is a lot of these people had equity within ESL or whatever, and they got a fucking, or face it or whatever, and they got a fucking giant bag. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, they don't well, have they don't to work it. again. Yeah. Yes. So why are they continuing? Like, why are we even doing this? Like what? What is so necessary about esports that everybody in the industry who is part and parcel of this? Whether you're part, it's not just Riot too. It's all the developers who have signed off on this, who had their own esports programs historically, who have people that I know there who are definitely saying that this is okay. And it's like, how did we get to this point where it is so worth? Just not having the bubble burst. You know what I mean? And I don't think the bubble bursting would be devastating. 
if you know what I mean. Like, it would suck for some people. Certainly some people would lose their jobs. But at the end of the day, wouldn't all of us who built this industry rather have the, you know, some moral clarity in this space? But the choice has been made. No, we have to have the unsustainable money because that's the only way we keep it at the current level. And the only unsustainable money is the Saudi money right now. Like, the, the crypto money's gone, the VC money's gone, the billionaire money is gone. This is the next pot of gold. And it's like, instead of just sitting there and taking a step back and saying, maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe this is a step too far. It's like, no, it must happen at any cost. And it, it's not like ESL or Face It had to die. They were fine. You know what I mean? Like, sure, you, we we knew that oh, modern times grew. I think I think a year before they sold to the Saudis, there was a different company who was going to buy ESL from like MTG. Like, there actually were people who were yeah. like bidders or whatever. Just they chose to sell to the Saudis eventually. I think. Well, I mean, and it was a giant amount of money. So, well, like, it was. Oh, by the way, it was a way bigger number as well. Like, don't worry about that. They, got, <laughs> like, they, they, just said, they added like a zero at the end or something. Like that. But, yeah, but like, absolutely. But, but like, <laughs> you know, and I I don't think you can at least in my mind, you can't really dismiss this as virtue signaling because these are people that I've known for a decade. Like, I don't think they are. I would, I hope that they're not these people. And it just is very weird to me that they just accept it. And now they're just part of this whole thing. And they all know they must know it's sports washing. They can't look at these numbers from having worked in the, in esports for 10 years and say, well, this is truly a reasonable business investment from the Saudi Arabian government Right? They'll make this money, but of course they're not. They're, they're losing tons you know, of money. ESL is a fucking European company. They all follow soccer slash football. They all know about sports rushing. They all know about the yeah. World Cup. They all, that, by the way, that story, if people don't know, that's how I knew that this would be how esports would go. Because that Qatar World Cup story started when they first got granted that they were going to have it, like 10 years earlier, Monty. I was seeing yep. those stories about workers dying building the stadiums. Like, no joke, like, I feel like 10 years ago or something, man, like ages ago. So that was like, so that was just slowly bubbling away on the stove as it it was always going to come to a head one day. I've got a couple of angles for you, right? One is a very obvious one, but people won't have thought it through, which is when people complained, like on Reddit or against us and people on our shows, Monty, like, oh, keep all that crypto shit out. You are all scammers and you are morally wrong and I'll never support you. You're evil crypto, crypto. Well, then, if you think crypto is bad, you must think executing people is really fucking bad. Think it through, you dumb fuck. But magically, when it came to executing people, and you know you can't do anything about it, actually, you're going the other way. You're going, but what about America and what they did? That's you. You're the same guy who's going, why didn't I say that when you said about crypto? When you went, what about crypto? I go, what about what US does in Yemen right now? You'd go, well, what does that mean? No, but isn't it worse what you are? Why aren't you calling out the US and Yemen? Like, that would be mad, wouldn't it? But that's what you're doing. And then the other angle, Monty, you've actually nailed it. You know, one of the saddest realizations I had when they first began this, I actually thought to myself, bro, this is actually where the joke is. We could literally rebuild esports from the ashes to be a thousand yep. times better. Because what I realized was, wait a minute. The OGs are all still here. You've got like Audi around. You've got like fucking Richard Lewis. You've got like Red Eye. Well, he's not really around that as much. You've got the really old school people, Joe Miller, uh, fucking Ralph Reichardt. I thought to myself, wait a minute. The industry in esports, much like every other major industry, Hollywood, music, it's not really all the people in it. 99% of them are just signal noise slash filler. Like they're just going along to get along. Really, if you have the head people, like in music, if you had all the heads of the labels or the biggest producers, you could absolutely go and make your own alternate industry and start over. With, you'd have to go down in revenue, but you'd start over and you'd do things, Monty. Like instead of working with the Saudis, you'd maybe give Blast the contract or you'd work with Starlander if they're coming back. And again, you'd work with old school people who were legit and you'd just do the same thing we did. You'd do the same formula, but without the Saudi money, you'd find it different. Maybe you do pay per view, but here's why you are fucked because one, you know, that list of names I just read off, most of them already themselves took the Saudi bag and are with them. And actually, the one that yeah. people don't know because they're in League of Legends, they don't know esports history is the esports World Cup. The esports World Cup, as far as I know, I don't know if he actually is the total person running it, but he's the figurehead, is done by Ralph Reichart. If you don't know, Ralph Reichart basically invented esports in the West. He, he made SK Gaming in 1997, which still exists, a giant multi gaming team. And he also made ESL from Turtle Entertainment, which is what now is the Esports World Cup and DFG. Yep. So this guy essentially is the guy who started it, and he's balls deep in this shit. So actually, the biggest problem is it isn't even just the Johnny Come Lately sec. We're all bashing, like I say, on the Bouse FFF. 
and fucking quick shot. No, the problem is the actual real people who built esports are the traitors. They're the ones who turned against it and slit its own throat to hand it over to a bunch of Saudis. That's that's fucking wild to me, mate. And as you say, some of these people, by the way, this isn't even their first bag, Monty. They've had bag after bag after bag. Like some of them, it's clear at this point in time, Monty. They also do it for the power and the influence, in my opinion. Because that's the other thing. When you see them make public statements, you could make a very neutral statement where you were like, look, this is about getting more investment. The economics don't make sense in esports. We're trying to build a professional product. They don't ever say that, Monty. It's the opposite of what they pretend about changing Saudi values. They align with the Saudis. They always say, have you noticed how they stress that? They always say, we have a shared vision and we have a lot of common values and they believe in what we... Be they actually do all the things you say that imply you are not trying to make them change. You're not saying, hey, we're going to hold you accountable. If anything, what you're saying is, well, sir, you paid for this, so I'm going to give you your full service, as it were. Like, this is fucking mad. Because like I said, there is, the only way you could make that industry is you'd need the OG people because they were the ones who had the ideas, the ones who built the industry, the pioneers. But nearly all of them are the people literally doing this. So it, there is no alternate industry, as it were. You can't do it. And by the way, you're right. Obviously, the game devs could always have changed this. They had the ultimate power. Right now, they have the godlike power. Yeah. But instead, as always, we don't direct our ire to riot and do anything to them. No, no, we just get the Baus FFF, a fucking European like streamer, and we tell him he's a piece of shit. Then we go, what's Double Left up to? Oh, EWC's on. And that's the fuck. <laughs> that's esports, baby. That's, the, you know, forget about it, Monty. It's esports. Exactly. It's that again. It's, back to that again. <laughs> it just feels so bad, man. Like, I just. It's wild, isn't it? I, I don't know. I, it, it just like really got to me in the last couple of days. It didn't get to me, you know, while the event was on or while I was watching it because I was, you know, thinking about the quality of the event and the games sure. and, you know, but I was just like, I was like, what the fuck, man? Why, why, are, why do we need to be here? Why does it have to? It, it just doesn't have to be like this. Bro, I've even just thought this up on the fly now. Here's the reason why you know this isn't real. You know, when they pretend it is necessary, which, by the way, already sounds like fucking Bane, like, this is necessary evil. Like, you already sound like a fucking villain when you say that. But more importantly, I would just say this angle, right? Here's how you could prove or disprove that everyone in esports was virtue signaling. Are you ready, Monty? You explicitly make an alternate tournament in one of these circuits that isn't run by the Saudis or in any way connected and it's pay-per-view, and you bill it as, this is a pay-per-view thing directly to support gay people and women. Well, logically, you guys don't like pay-per-view, but obviously you want to stand for your values and your political opinions, so wouldn't you all support it? Wouldn't you all buy a pass? By the way, if the industry wouldn't, then the Saudis were right. It has to be the Saudis. And two, it would just prove everyone was full of shit the whole time. Because at the end of the day, like I would pay per pay for you anyway. So if there, if in theory it was some like moral thing I cared about, surely I'd be even more enticed to do it. Like, wouldn't that be a great cause to give my money to if I'm some fan? The same fan's only going to spend the money on a skin anyway. Like, if that was real, you could do that. I feel like that's even a crowdfunding element that could work. Keyword could. I actually am not sure. I, I kind of I could flip a coin. I'm not sure if fans would do it or not. What, what do you think? Would they pay I mean, for it? I would hope so. <laughs> I mean, I would. But seems possible, though, right? You'd at least try it if you wanted an alternate. Yeah. Alternative, rather. I don't know. The whole, the whole thing is just... Oh, it's, a it, it's, it's just... It's just depressing to think that, you know, the battle's already over, too. There is no going oh, back it from this. It's just... It's just done. And, uh, you know, there isn't going to be... Because people are unwilling to actually stand up from within these companies, and the fans are unwilling to get involved in this. And as we know, the Asian fans don't care. Um, oh, so. Gosh, yeah. You know, I guess this is just how it's going to be. So enjoy MSI and Riyadh probably forever. <laughs> oh, oh no, this train left that station already, yeah. <laughs> the question is just how many carriages get added and how many more trains go with it. Exactly. <laughs> and also, like, you know, they're really hoping to drive that tourism, and I hope they do because the crowd was, like, half empty for a lot of these matches. I told you that would be bad. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, from the MSA and CS last year, that's what we learned, is, like, unfortunately, the crowd are sort of what you call, like, plastic fans. Like, they're there because they've heard that general thing, like, there's eSports and it's a new thing. But they're not, like, a fan of T1 or TES, and they're not going there, like, Vicar, please. Like, so, actually, you know what? It's about, like, there's certain times eSports crowds aren't that great, but they're a thousand times better than these crowds. These crowds <laughs> were, like, fucking, like, falling asleep almost, wasn't it? It was just, like, crickets. It's like that shit. Like, <laughs> like, you know, joke is you should actually really pump in crowd noise. Do what the Indianapolis Colts used to do back in the day. I mean, all that, that money and they can't hire some people to cheer, man. What the hell? I know. <laughs> Bro, you'd think, you'd think if there's anything the Saudis understand, it's about getting people and forcing them to do something on camera. You know what? You know? You'd think if you, you guys mastered that. Just, you know, just have to be a gun. There's all sorts of incentives, you know. <laughs>
Because I agree. You can't, bro, even, like, this is the joke. Remember, people claim in North Korea, that's what happens when they have all those people celebrating Kim Jong-un. It's like, obviously, they're told to do it or they'll be killed. And all. You can't even organize some people to pretend to like League of Legends. Like, <laughs> by the way, it's not even hard. Like I said, just ha hand out a fake aside. Like, faker is still the goal. Like, just give that to some kid, you know. Like, just put the it's applause so easy sign to do on. This. Just your yeah. sign on when you need some noise. <laughs> what you do is just applaud if you want um, gay people executed in our country. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then you just go, holy shit, they're really psyched for this T1 game, guys. They're jumping out of their seats. Their shared values are just like us. Because, <laughs> by the way, that's another thing. Someone get the fucking AI thing out and do a Kendrick Lamar, not like us, but it's about the Saudis, so they're not like us. Do that. <laughs> get that beef going. <laughs> what a time to be alive. Well... At least, at least we we're the all we're the we we've said this many times before. We didn't actually expect that oh, last three nation would be uh would be as the name, apt as we didn't it is. Know the, the name was that literal. We thought it was just like witty, you know, metaphorical allusion. No, no, actually, just a literal <laughs> statement of fact. In because <laughs> everyone else is bought, and that's the thing, Thorin, is that now that people know that this shit is going to be happening, like MSI is going to be happening. There's not going to be any, I mean, there weren't any, there, people like just silently didn't go to this. They didn't say, hey, this is messed up, or I don't like the direction that esports is going. And they certainly won't now. How many of the people are just going to be there next year? Because it's MSI, right? Yeah. All of them is the answer. By the way, I also just don't, this is, this is why I always say, I actually think the problem here is that we set up this false expectation the expectation was always absurd from the outset that people wouldn't attend a video game tournament, which is their job, because they didn't like what the country is doing. Because the reason why that's mental is, spoiler, like all of us in Counter Strike, for example, have been to China and Russia. We've already been there, even when there was lots of like things that were still dodgy and you know, is Putin a dictator? All that shit was there the whole time. But we all attended the event because the point is, and this is the key framing, it was never even a consideration. At the time, you just thought, can I go to the event? Did they give me a visa? And you'd go. Like there was never any like, ah, but but is this a moral position? And who am I in the world? And can I influence Russia and China? No one was ever doing that. There was that was such a, an artificial premise. Although I will say the sad thing is, it's obviously a very American idea. Isn't isn't it? Like, they'll do whatever we say. It's like, will they though? Will they, bro? <laughs> I don't think they will. <laughs> I, by the way, though, I will say, though, this is why I told people, I'll still watch the tournament. I fucking despise leagues. So you know what? Even though I, my only complaint about you, it's too short. I'd rather it was all BO5, so it was like a double limb or something. Like, because I actually still enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed, like an IEM back in the day, but with real tape. I, who the fuck doesn't enjoy seeing BLG play Genji immediately again? And then, oh, wow. Well, because notice how, Monty, this tournament proved what I've always thought, which is, you know what? A month makes a lot of difference. I know this from Counter-Strike, mate. So we treat it in league stupidly, especially back in the day when it was already Worlds. Like, when you win Worlds, you were just the best team that year. Bro, all we know is you were the best team that day. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I mean, I can tell you right now, DRX circuit, was yeah. not the best team, Ollie. <laughs> Of course, all type of assassins, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, Samsung, this is, a, this is a really ridiculous. So the point is, if we'd have had these tournaments back then, like a month later, there was another tournament, someone else might have won it, which, by the way, is also awesome for the narratives. Like I said about the T1 fans, hasn't this given every T1 fan a shot in the arm? Of course it has. Although, by the way, my joke, and I'll make it here, goes like this. What's that? The GOAT won a World Cup, and everyone's pretending he's still the best. Well, enough about Messi. Let's get on to Faker. Not bad, not bad. Same shit. All right, By the well, way, don't you find that mild money? Like this isn't. Remember, <laughs> before they were saying it's just an esports award. Who cares? This is an MVP of a tournament, bro. When you give people who are the goat the fake MVPs, it actually waters down their real legacy. <laughs> All the real MVPs he won. Like this is this is mental. This is actually mental. So, like the idea that Faker in 2024 was the MVP of EWC, but Marin was the MVP of Season Five Worlds. Like, what are we even doing <laughs> at this point? I feel like God. What are that we was... saying, bro? What are we saying? <laughs> That was ridiculous that, Mar that Marin won the MVP in 2015 uh, over Faker. Um, it's like, oh, we can't just give it to him again, right? Except if it's 10 years later, then we must give him all of them, whether he actually won it or not. Like, the, the grossest thing about this one, I'm sure you thought the same thing, Marty. Look, I do always think you can have a debate who the MVP is. But, bro, I have been a massive critic of owner. 
This was like the fucking tournament of his life, bro. He looked like Prime Canyon in some of these games. Like, he was fucking smurfy. You have to give it up to him for this tournament. So the idea that because Faker plays with him, he doesn't get the MVP. Like, come so, on, bro. I, I come think, on. I, think, I think the argument is, like, Faker does have a shot at MVP of the tournament, you know, if you're looking at the entire tournament and not just the finals. Um, sure. You know, especially, like, a lot of those, like, liquid games, I think he really did play very well in. Um, but I mean, even in that, like, I would oh, say like owner is team liquid from the LCS <laughs> than against TES from China. Ah, oh, it's a fucking real, real head scratch on that one. I, mean, I don't know how we did it. You know, Car Caria also had a super pop off final, by the sure. way. I mean, yeah, yeah. especially for a guy who was looking really rather ropey domestically. Slope, yeah. Uh, he had a very good tournament. Zayas had yes. a very good tournament. You know, some of his rumble games were absolutely exceptional. Uh, so look, I think you know it's a very good showing from T1 overall. But Thorin, before we get into that, and we will do the t the actual tournament analysis. So, by the way, guys, if you're tired of us hearing us talk about Saudi Arabia, don't worry, we don't have to do that anymore for a while, probably <laughs> until they actually announce. Not in league, at least. Not, Not in league. league. Come back to the Four Horsemen. There's probably going to be some yes. sort of like esports World Cup wrap up when all of the games yes. are done and all of the numbers are in, and we can actually discuss that from an industry perspective. That is almost certainly coming. But you know, up until that point on this show, the next one will be when they inevitably announce the new season, which of course will probably be like later, you know, at the end of this year or something yeah. like that, as they announce the circuit. It'll probably be it'll probably actually be early January if we're being honest. Um, uh, I would anticipate. So you guys are tired of hearing us talk about this. Well, there you go. But we do have a sponsor. And as we always say, supporting our sponsors is the best way to support us here at LFN. And our and they're sponsor, all good products. you get to enjoy it too. It's not just for exactly. us. Exactly, you will enjoy it also. We recommended it to you. <laughs> we are. We we turn down sponsors. We we have. You know, we use the products uh, actively. We've got more coming up for you in the next few weeks. So it's been very successful for us. Thank you very much. So our sponsor for this show is Babbel, and it's a great way to learn a language if that has been on your bucket list guys um it's all designed by native speakers it's designed for practical conversations that means that when you enter like a lesson on the app on your phone you are actually learning some new phrases applying them both in terms of speaking because it does voice recognition in terms of listening exercises in terms of like using them in a text message conversation so it really does drill it into you uh very effectively you can do just a little bit of a 10 minute lesson every day. Um, they are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks designed by real people for real conversations. So um, it is less gamified than potentially some other apps that you might find out there. But I think, you know, it is uh, it is more scholarly let's say, in its approach, and it is focused on practical results. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash summoning. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash summoning, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash summoning. Rules and restrictions, they apply. And this is something that, guess what? A lot of you want products. You may not live in the United States. Well, you could use this from anywhere. It's an app on your phone. It's on the internet. So enjoy. If you guys have been looking forward to learning a new language and maybe helping out LFN a little bit as well. Good stuff. Thank you to Babbel. By the way, so, this is where you can put your money where your mouth is. Because, you know, people always say that thing often to be pretentious. Like, I'd love to learn Russian or Japanese so I could read Dostoevsky or this anime in its original language. You can do it. Let's just get this up, do a few lessons a day, and you will you will get closer to that dream. And by the way, that's actually even something where if you did do it for real and you're not just pretending, that actually would be the way to do it, by the way. Like, start learning the language, then, like, I wouldn't start, like, straight away with, like, fucking Dostoevsky. I'd start with, like, a comic or a manga or something simple with a few yeah. words. You could probably actually get up to speed on that if you do practice each day, yeah. Sure. And you get the three months free or whatever it is, right? What, what was 60% off. What's the deal? <laughs> oh, 6% off. There you go. Right, there you go. Yeah. So, very good deal. All right. So, By let's the way, talk. I actually have a detail for you. I've got, I right. want to throw something out to you because there's a piece of information people might not be aware of that is actually mental, which is the worst thing about how they scheduled this Esports World Cup, Monty, is they've actually affected the integrity of the LCK because the, uh, based on what I read, right? So, today, 
T1 played Frederick Brion and went 2-1 against them. And in, this, in the latter games, where they looked shit. And what people said is, they said T1 arrived at the airport 1 a.m. Korea time, and then they had to play the game at 5 p.m. local time. That's absurd. Well, that is actually fucking absurd. My question is, why were they, why did they stay in Saudi Arabia so long afterwards? Like, what were they doing there? Because the game... Fair, Monty, they probably had like a 12-hour fucking like press tour of like, you know, <laughs> exactly. like, a little prince so and so. They almost it, certainly had to do all yeah. that. Yeah, I have no doubt. Yeah, so, no doubt. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of ridiculous because, yeah. I mean, the finals were over by like 10 o'clock on Sunday yeah. night, local time. So they could have yeah. left at midnight on Sunday night. Um, they could have left any time on Monday. So if they were, if they were on a flight that got them back very late, you know, or early, I should say, on Wednesday morning, that does seem a little bit suspicious and as if they had other things that they were doing in Saudi Arabia that had nothing to do with this tournament because they absolutely could have left sooner. So that is weird. By the way, someone did ask in chat, can you learn Arabic? I don't know if you can, <laughs> but don't worry. Esports people don't need to. They just need to speak the language of money. That's what you need to speak. The universal language, some would say. The universal language. Um. So, yeah, I mean, look, T1 had a great event. And, you know, one thing that you do have to credit T1 with, and this happened at Worlds last year, is that when they are struggling in a specific meta, what they do, and this is part of them being a cohesive roster that has gone back two years, is they don't necessarily play meta things. They go back to their old bag of tricks and they pull out their pick comps, which they've always been the best with, and then all of a sudden we have... Jin and we have Sivir and the way that they play these champions is to create long range engages is to collapse onto side lanes using Sivir ultimate. And so when they can play really aggressively around picks and around engage and like try and set vision traps, this is when they're at their best. And for whatever reason, they don't always do this domestically. They get sucked into the LCK meta, but when they go to world like world events, international events, and they start to like falter a little bit, that's when they kind of remember that they can do these things. And often it's very successful because they are the best team in the world at doing these styles, even if they're not exactly. Oh, they are. By the way, I agree with you as well. That's actually the upside of having the same roster because actually, if people don't know, there were two classic lineups in Counter Strike that did this, and there were both teams that were Polish teams featuring Neo and Taz. There was one in one point six. They were nicknamed the Golden Five, and there was Virtus Pro and CS:GO. And because they kept their same five-man rosters for years and years, Monty, it's the same thing. Even if they slumped, because they had like essentially they were almost like telepathic at that point. Like they played together so long, you just know what the other person's thinking, how they play. They could always reinvent themselves. Whereas I actually do think if you look at other teams actually usually is when you slump you make the roster move that's when people get very cynical and do the short term move so the upside look the downside for T1 is this they didn't upgrade to all the play they didn't get Kanye they didn't get fucking Viper or whatever that's a downside but it does come with its own strength which is the familiarity they have no other lineup can compete with them like Genji has to just be better in the game they can't compete in experience how much they played together and stuff like no one can in fact there's no roster in the world pretty much is like that yeah and, I, and look I think like it is a really big advantage for them at certain points in time. Um, I, like I said, I don't understand why they don't always do this in other instances oh. in LCK. There's something yes. about the international experience that really like brings out, at least in the last year has kind of brought out the best in them. Obviously not at this past MSI, but you know, it, it's also that when it's a new patch thorn, um, it also, I think when there have been big changes that have been made, it also helps to be able to go back to something that you feel really comfortable with rather than like groping around in the dark. And, you know, this was a big patch that we saw. Nobody had ever played on 1413 before. It changed a lot of stuff. When you have best of three single a limb, you get situations where Gen G like really misread the meta yep. and they gave up the Tristana and, you know, they should have won that game, but they, you know, to credit to top esports, they played very well around using like yep. Ivern, Tristana and Ezreal, which also coincidentally they tried to use in the finals against T1, but T1 actually had answers for it, including Yasuo with the wind wall. But they had been able to see it previously and top did do a good job of like f clawing their way back into the game, setting up the yeah, you yeah. know leapfrogging Ivern brushes. It could have been playing. five games. Yeah. Yeah, playing with the 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 ADCs inside those brushes. And like Gen G, they played badly, sure, but they should have won game one. And then 
when we when we look at their actual draft priority, it turns out they were just completely wrong in terms of which champions were super strong on this patch. And Top had a very good read. They kept going after the Tristana throughout most of that bracket, and they got to the point where they won in the finals, and then T1 had to like get rid of it and ban it out, right? And this pick is absolutely outrageous right now. And Liquid was also helped by the fact that Ziggs functions very tr similarly to Tristana in terms of fast-pushing turrets, which became a major, major feature of this event. Not to say that it wasn't previously because we saw Ziggs in LPL and bot lane in particular, but prior to this event, previous patches, it just got super, it looked super powerful uh, on this patch. And Liquid also played, I think, extremely well. Um, what a dope, yeah. I mean, very, huge credit to Liquid. But, you know, I don't read too much into Genji's loss because you don't even have any time to adapt here. You don't have time to scrim. You don't have time to prepare on this patch. You get one best of three. You have one bad read against a good team. And Top Esports is a world-class team, and you're just done, right? So. By the way, I think that is even an area I'll touch on for a second. I feel like because of all the, almost the inertia of, of League of Legends history being that Koreans are always not only ahead in macro, but they're always pretty much like the standard of macro. And especially it was the LCS that never was anywhere close. The LCS during the Bjergsen double lift era was just, you win the lane, smash them, and then you meet for a team fight in the middle or fucking on Baron and you just win that. And or, then it's like, I am a champion. Or you stand there and wait for them to throw into you. That, that was one. the classic. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> Even though I don't think because of the firepower and the star power of Team Liquid, they can ever compete with like Gen.G and fucking um, BLG and so uh, like Worlds, they can't win it. But I'll tell you what, Monty, if you just look only at the macro and how they do that, that is actually LCK level in my opinion. Like that's actually world class sometimes. I, I sometimes I mean, think they really do run a really, really tight ship. You do anyway. remember me saying earlier this year that I thought Team Liquid had world class macro, right? In spring split, yeah, I Mark, literally course, said they were, that. They weren't going to actually beat BLG, though. They would still get dusted <laughs> off, you know. Like, they weren't going to actually fucking, like, power but, through the best players in the world. Sure. But I, I think, like, this is a team no, that has be been underrated for a long bro. time. Like, like, if you look at it, the problem with G2 is they're sort of cheating money. They have, like, good macro and the best players you can possibly get. So, like, you can you can look at it either way on that one. T1, I think, by the fact that they don't have the best players in the world, that's what really shows you how well fucking drilled they are. Like, the, the, the decision-making in this team is really impressive, I've got to say. I, I'm a fan of this team. That's why I keep saying, to me, BDS and Team Liquid are the LCK teams of the Western regions. Like, I actually love watching people play, like, a consistent style that punishes idiots. I love that. Yeah, and I think, you you know, I have been obviously very critical and deservedly so and so of Yun and APA in the past. But in this, so first off, I think that whatever happened, you know, around their Korean boot camp at MSI was very helpful in leveling Yun up in particular. And then APA, APA, he's been better. And I want to give a lot of credit to APA because his map awareness is really good. His, his awareness of when to be in side lanes, how far to push up, his ability to use teleport, his ability to like hit Ziggs ults into the side lane to be there in time has been excellent. Um, so these are very, he has very good, like I think holistic map knowledge, but he also has stumbled into multiple metas that really just hit the sweet spot of his champion pool. Like the question would be is what does APA look like in, you know, an assassin mid meta? And the answer is yes. probably not great. Um, yes. But you know, he's kind of gone from strength to strength, which is like, well, he always was an Aurelian soul and Talia player. And then he always was a Ziggs player. And like these champions have been kind of uniquely it is viable. Insane how they both those champions in it. It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> he's so, just like, essentially got the, the ultimate sweet spot in his career to play like this. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, it's fun to watch because he is legitimately good at those champions. Um, but you do have to acknowledge that that has been to a certain degree, um, you know, one of the main points of, of success for him. Um, also, you know, it's not like his Corky or Trist is bad or anything like that either. And if we're being honest, Team Liquid should have beaten T1. They should have won that. Like, they absolutely oh, had a chance. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. if T1 doesn't steal that Baron in game number three, if they if owner doesn't steal that, like, I think Team Liquid just wins the series. Not the reason I think owner's the MVP, mate. Like, he got him through the tough series, yeah. So, I mean, a big credit to TL. Um, do you know what? Here's how I'll say it, Monty. You could, even though I do think Top Esports absolutely could have won game four, potentially got a game five. Actually, on paper, Team Liquid was the team that gave Team One the hardest time. For real. So that's not yep. even a joke. So, yeah, props to them and the coaching staff, obviously. Yeah. And like APA had a super good Ziggs game in game number one, and they played, 
you know, the pressure game extremely well and they traded up cross map consistently. But that's part that's part and parcel of having, you know, the the Ziggs or the Tristan available. Oh, it's the thing, though. I do have one comment to say, and this is a, a PSA to APA. This is the PSA. Where was that energy at? Where's that big dick energy, homie? If you want to talk shit to people and you want to trash talk, here's what I want you to do next time you play T1. Type in World Say one minute into the game, Chovy's my goat. Do something like that, mate. Let me see the big balls play. Do type in the fake. You, you were really good in 2017 or something. That's trash talk. <laughs> Don't just fucking trash talk LCS players. Bring the fucking fire. Like, I would love that, by the way. That would be so fucking raw. I'd love to see it. Like, I'd love to see Faker's face cam when he types that into the thing. Like, <laughs> do it. Do it. Do it, pussy. Do it. <laughs> oh, also, okay. Thorne, I forgot to say this earlier about um, uh, th this is a little addendum onto the production support because remember how you said like riot said like oh we're not offering any kind of like production support right so one of the things that esl did was they went back and hired a bunch of the people that lec fired to work this event oh, perfect Genius. so i mean obviously like why wouldn't you use trained observers for years you know yes. to, to do this event it's sm a smart thing to do but the way that riot got away with this was basically by through their own layoffs, providing ESL with seasoned oh, League of Legends production no, prof no. professionals. What have we done? It's like we just give you a load of our best people who we can't afford anymore. Oh, fuck. What so, oh, well, enjoy the event. That's ridiculous. I know, like, this is like some politics shit where, you know, you have to use like all packs and shit to get all the money to buy all these securities means to the same person. It's ridiculous, isn't it? So, so it's like, you know, I guess technically... You didn't provide the production support, except you did by firing the people who knew how to produce League of Legends events. And then probably, yes. if I'm going to guess, Thorin, gave that contact info to ESL. <laughs> well, I'm listen, pretty sure there's like... No Listen, Muggs, if the Saudis remember, appreciate anything, it's being given a list of people to investigate. <laughs> that's true. You know, that's kind of their shit. So they're more in it. So, but but you know what? The Twitter accounts did yet. <laughs> but you know, on the nose, that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, basically, according to German law, if Riot lays them off, they couldn't rehire them as freelancers, yes. which is why they couldn't. They had to fly then people from like Dublin and North America yes. in when they fired the LEC people to fix LEC before it went before it exploded right after they did that. Yes. So it was totally ridiculous. Right. But there's nothing to say that they can't just be like, well, well we can't well, hire these people, but here's a list of names that you could hire and con here's their email address. Why don't you go go crazy there? ESL. So by again, the way, it's just further lies. Are we, uh, by the way, we can obviously we can drive like an AWC if you want. But I did remember something I wanted to get your take on because I saw this today and it made me it blew my mind, mate. It was posted in the early hours of the morning for me by Kelsey Moser. Right. She posted a thing where it's like uh, something about like the people who I think it's like the balance team or something, or the people who operate like solo queue and punishments. Maybe it was even that thing about how do we punish the players? I forget who the Genesis was, but Kelsey posted a, a, a picture of like part of an article. And in the article, there's a part that's mental, mate. I can see why she got triggered to fuck. Cause if you don't know Kelsey Moser, she was the original analyst that never shut the fuck up about side laning and how powerful it is. Cause obviously she watched LEC, et cetera. So in this thing, right, obviously they're mainly in theory addressing how solo queue is played. But remember riot games have consistently shown a precedent Monty, they want the pro game to look how they want solo queue to be played. Hence, we can't have lane swaps. We can't have like all the fucking double jungle. We can't have any of that shit because they won't be able to do it in the pro. So you do have to wonder and get scared when they start saying things about the casual game of what they might do to the pro game. So this quote will actually make you fucking lose your mind. Listen, she, they put... Instead of interacting with other players in a team fight or the objective, notice it's even inferred there. That's what you're supposed to do. They tend to farm side lanes and just generally switch <laughs> off focus, right? That that sentence is cancer in the context of what makes League of Legends great. Because one of the things I love about League is that even when actually they've hard forced the dragon, you can still always have that side laning option. It's still still plausible. With that like, just means they're gonna so, they're gonna nerf teleport just, into the ground. It implies they're just gonna kill it. And it's just, and the worst thing is Monty. If you thought League was like Babby's first MOBA before, get ready for the only ways to win the game to be the Fisher Price buttons of Baron fucking Grobs and Dragons. Yeah. If that's all the game becomes, it's gonna be really stupid if that's all it is like i mean right now if people don't know the best player in the world jovi is fucking a god of side laning that's one of the ways you can't beat his team and because TP essentially is great. you have to deal with him and yeah oh, it's, it's fabulous it does all the fags and shit yeah and they already nerfed it a bunch i mean you guys remember like you you you, you just can't tp 
except the turrets you can't in the cancel early it. game. You can't do all sorts yeah, of shit. Yeah. So like, you know, it, it already did get nerfed pretty significantly. You can't just have a party in bot lane anymore like you used to, which I agree was lame that like if you overextend slightly, all of a sudden there are five people in your oh, lane. Like that's sure. stupid. <laughs> it is. But they, they mostly fixed that. And I, I just I think like split pushing and being able to provide pressure in order to take objectives is a very healthy and good part of the game. So I would be bummed to see if they destroyed teleport. Especially the way they phrased it, Monty. Like, they actually made it sound like the concept of side laning is inherently toxic, as though every side laner is the NASA who just farms to, like, 48 minutes. Like, they're ignoring, like... Oh, by the way, what would it even do to the champion diversity in the game if you couldn't side lane anymore? It'd be stupid, wouldn't it? Yeah. I think it would kill the game, mate. It would, it would, it would suck so much of my enjoyment out of it. Well, it's also that... Arguably, the objectives are already too important and the game is already too binary based around yes, objective control. Um, so it would it would just exacerbate that problem even worse. So it's like I actually already think people don't understand that what Riot has done to the game shows how godlike the top Asian teams are. Because if anything, Riot even made it way easier. Like, for example, in there's many times in the game you don't even have to attempt a 1-3-1 or play on two lanes at once. Like, you absolutely can do the LCS special, get a Baron and win the middle fight and just fucking go up and bash the base in. Like, they essentially already made it as simple as possible to win the game. And they and you still get outmaneuvered unless you're Team Liquid. That's why I give mad props to Team Liquid. Team Liquid is the one, like, outlier that shows you can learn these concepts and apply them, but no, loads of the Western teams are still playing stupid. Like, Fnatic doesn't understand any of these concepts. Like, they just do whatever the fuck they want. <laughs> they play solo queue. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, uh, back to back to the games themselves. Like, you what, want to talk about there... top esports a bit? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I came mate, in they saying... They were cooking I... before the final, and obviously that first game was good. Like, they were cooking this tournament. I, I said when we started this tournament last week before we started that I thought that it was a real possibility that Genji and top were the very best teams at this tournament. Yeah. Um, and we, we kind of saw why that was true. Now there was a big kind of meta shift, right. That we have to obviously discuss, which definitely surprised Gen G more than any of the other top teams at this event, but top esports came in with the, with the Tristana priority with the Ezreal priority, you know, they have 369 who has been playing this Mordekaiser typically into the Skarner matchups in LPL, but he's he's willing to play it here into the Cassante matchup also. But also, like, you know, they got a lot of very what ended up being very OP picks. Um, you know, Sejuani rose in priority throughout this tournament. Rumble was already high priority, Ash was already high priority, Tristana was already high priority, but was arguably just like first pick perma you know, by the end of things. So, I mean, top esports, I think really came in with a strong meta read and for the most part played well. And people love to criticize Tian. And like, I, I don't, Tian is a Dada award winner. Like, let's be clear about that. He has played like absolute shit at international events, but he was also the best performing player on the FPX that won the world championship. Like when you think about the 2019 world championship, you think about Tian's Kiana and these kind of carry junglers that he was playing at that event. And he had an am amazing performance overall. So He's also like, being an LPL MVP, like the guy is not like he only had that one tournament, you know? Yeah. And he and looks you, good at MSI. Like he's just a good player. He's just like, very up and down. The problem with him is it, it, he's fragile. As I say, Monty, when the bottom drops out, it completely drops out. You know yeah, what I mean? And, and you, you see this like in that final game against T1 where he just inexplicably dies as Ivern yep. and then walks the respawns walks to the other side of the map, yep. which was by the way pure insanity from Tian because they had just completed a full clear. He had just died after a full clear. He knew Sejuani was there. Now Sejuani had cleared top to bot, taken crab after he died, and that means that Sejuani had recalled, and there were only two spots that Sejuani could be. One of them was upper river, the topside river crab, and the other one was Sejuani's Krugs. And Tian knew this because he put a ward in the tri brush while he's trying to gank top lane. And he walked past the crab, so he knew Sejuani wasn't there. And then he dies to the Sejuani anyway. And it's like, you can't win that 2v2, even if you see it coming, because you're Cassante Ivern into Sejuani Rumble. You don't win that. So it was just such a fucking bizarre decision because he knew exactly where Sejuani had to be by deductive reasoning, and he still died again.
That's why the weirdest thing about this guy is like, it's funny that the, the claim always was he had the wrist issues because he clearly does have hands. Like he can make fucking plays and he can be proactive. The problem is though, Monty, I have to say it, being as he never really has looked as consistently as good as that world tour with FPX, my obvious joke would be, yeah, but this is what happens if you just take one of the soldiers from Ender's army and you don't have Ender controlling the game because fucking Doinby was just Ender in Ender's game. Just like, <laughs> do this now, move here. You come back and bugger. He, that was like, the, that was the fucking true like battlefield gen he was killing it, man. <laughs> Not the Ender who used to cast LEC guys. Uh, yeah, obviously the good himself. one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a book, guys. Ender's Game is a book. Um, and also a bad movie. But It's a terrible movie. It's really bad. Yeah. <laughs> and you know it's a bad movie? If you can cast Ben Kingsley, it's still a bad movie. Ben Kingsley is in a I shocking mean, number of bad like, movies. Didn't it, didn't it even also have like Harrison Ford or something? Dude, I'd like some good actors. Yes. It's just a dog shit movie, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's just bad. <laughs> Ben, ben Kingsley is in a shocking amount of terrible movies, though. So it's not necessarily. I mean, he's a great actor, but he he has no, been I mean, in a lot of video it. game movies. I think he was in like the Blood Rain movie as well, that like vampire video game. I, I don't know, he's been in a lot of terrible. Obviously, films. just likes checks, man. He obviously just says yes to a lot of checks. <laughs> I think I think he guys. likes checks, and he also likes playing ridiculous characters. And he's like, oh, well, right. I could be a hilarious vampire sure right. <laughs> right. he probably just doesn't way, get fun <laughs> i will absolutely never get over that stupid thing where he's like the mandarin in that iron man movie that's like <laughs> it's so stupid it's mad but whatever i do love ben kingsley i don't give a fuck I do love no he's great <laughs> it's not right, it's... though he does absolutely walk into some ridiculous characters though yeah it's true. <laughs> i think it's the blood rain one that he was in uh am i wrong oh yeah he is in blood rain yes the yui bull directed blood rain movie <laughs> but if you want to hear us talk more about films, go on over to the Inside on Esports. Oh, I have channel. one thing I have to. You know what? <laughs> Even though, like, obviously, we could do anything on this show, bit. So just we'll have a five minute tangent. And here's the tangent. <laughs> Bro, I, I I skimmed to a bit of the video where you were talking about this, but you think you think House of the Dragon is better than Game of Thrones? It is. Like, as in even the early seasons? Yes. Fucking hell. I don't know about that. Here's the thing. I, I'll agree with this. I think I always say I think Game of Thrones like half is good and then the latter half's diminishing returns. So look, compared to the latter half, yeah, I'm with you, it kills it completely. It's way better. In the same way as like the Mandalorian is just better than like the fucking shit sequels, obviously. Like it's just a way better concept, right? But the the first like two or three seasons, especially the first two, I think are really good at Game of Thrones. I'm amazed you think it's better than those. It is the actors are those <laughs> insane as well. Like well, well, Sean Bean's a fucking boss. So he's yes. a really good actor in that. That is true. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that because I think the first few seasons of Game of Thrones are bad because I think they're good. However, Game of Thrones also has some garbage tier actors like Amelia Clark and uh, Kit Harrington. Oh, that's true. Like yeah, really true. bad. There yeah. are actually yeah, no bad good. actors in House of the Dragon. Like none. Like oh, it, I mean, the suffering okay. you get through some of those like Jon Snow and Daenerys Targaryen scenes sure. is pretty intense. And people just like to sure. forget that those scenes. But the reason why uh, I think House of the Dragon is just better. It's better for me. Let me put it that way. Because what okay. I liked about Game of Thrones is like all of the political intrigue. And this show is literally nothing but like feudalism, succession, drama, political intrigue. And it's all a bunch of characters. Like the entire show show is just held together by the personal relationships that you see develop over decades and so it's really interesting because all of the characters are directly connected to one another and nice. there isn't some like fucking like side quest where Arya Stark like just goes That's away true. for years and it's just like yeah. on an island by herself um, so I think Game of Thrones doesn't hold together as well as this show and what I also okay. like about this show is that the first season does an extremely good job of giving you like the snapshots in history over 16 years where all of the, the characters are, you know, the, the time periods in which they are most affected by one another and like the most significant events happen and then it'll skip forward. And then what what ends up happening is like they don't blow their load because obviously the load blowing happens when the, all the dragon fighting occurs. But they they like really scale into it. Like a lot of shows would just be like, let's have dragons fighting dragons now. And it's it's not that like it really does escalate and the pacing is excellent. Anyway, it's a very good show. I was surprised at how good it was. But yes, I do anyway, think it's better. If you better want to hear Game more of, of that, <laughs> check out Nerd Legion. He talks about that with Dora <laughs> for an hour. Um, and then Dora does that thing where, even though actually I think Dora himself is a Christian, obviously Dora's reference point yes. at all times in life. The good book is just Star Wars, and it? it's always referenced to Star Wars. <laughs> Everything must be compared to Star Wars for some reason. Well, that's me. I just did that myself, so whatever. We can all be hypocrites.
Um, so yeah, anyway, I think House of the, House of the Dragon is like extremely good. Um, and the I really is very good. It. I'll give you that. Like you can tell because oh, if people don't great. know, it's so obvious to me from the people who are the actors in that that it's one of those ones where you know when someone becomes famous in Hollywood, like Woody Allen, everyone wants to work with them. You can tell a lot, like because a lot of these actors, like Risa fans and fucking Paddy Constant, these are all good actors. Like, oh, great! You can tell they just what were like. Oh, can I be a Game of Thrones essentially? So they, yeah, they have a pretty good cast. There's some bangers in there for sure. Um, Matt Smith, the guy who plays Damon, is fucking great. Yeah, in House he's good of the in Dragon. pretty much everything he does. Yeah, he's in the, um, same in the so, Crown, and all that shit. Yeah, yeah, he's great in the Crown. Uh, so anyway, like I, I think House of Dragon is like legit, extremely good. And if you guys haven't seen it, I personally, I think that okay. they figured out a lot of the formula of how to do a show better. So the comparison I made, Thorin, is like. I like uh, Next Generation a lot, but I think Deep Space Nine is the better Star Trek show because they kind of figured out how to really refine that show by the time D DS9 came along. And I feel the same way here. It's just much more focused. It's much more focused and it feels a lot better. Not that there's anything wrong with Game of Thrones. I also enjoyed that at the okay. start. <laughs> also, I think it's going to be hard to make this bad like Game of Thrones because we already know what the ending to this story is because George R. R. Martin has already written it. So there's not going to be confusion or the showrunners taking over. Whatever the fuck happened at the end of Game of Thrones just isn't going to happen here. It is also less epic in scope because it's not building into some sort of supernatural war. Like, you know, it's just between two different factions vying for the throne of the kingdom. So it can't like kind of go off the rails in my opinion. So there you go. <laughs> that, those are my thoughts. Also the acolyte sucks and we're releasing an episode about Madam Webb, which is the next one. And that movie is so bad. <laughs> so <laughs> oh, that's one of those ones where like, I wouldn't even watch that on a plane. It just looks actually like, intolerable. Oh, it's so, that's so, some Guantanamo Bay level shit, mate. It, it is. It does cross over into so bad it's good. I will say that. Like, it is so bad. <laughs> it is so bad. But you don't have to watch it, Thor, and you can just laugh at Doa and my, me making fun of it. So <laughs> save your time. I will say as well, us. though, one thing, one thing I am a tiny bit annoyed at, Monty. I understand in the modern day, people are trying to use that concept of, like, less is more. And you're sort of working with, like, you know, more limited frameworks. So you can design the storyline. But one thing I do hear about stuff like Game of Thrones and even, like, Lord of the Rings, Monty, is the way the whole premise goes like this. It's like... Of course, hundreds of years ago, this amazing battle happened where a giant dragon burned a whole thing to the ground. And then there was the Silmarillion, an enormous spider fought Morgoth. In the and then you go, holy <laughs> shit, can I see that? They go, no, 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 that was in the past. You go, bro, you're deciding this. Like, what are you talking about? We're not in that time. Like, you could just do that series. Like, can I see that, please? No, no, no. Anyway, enjoy Rings of Power. Like, oh, fucking hell, what is this, please? Why are you, why are you teasing me? Why are you teasing me, motherfucking shit? Let me see that show already. Let me see that. Let me see that. I want to see how Harold Hall got burnt to the ground. That's what I want to see. I want to see that. Well, maybe they'll go do it. That's 100 years before House of the Dragon. So maybe maybe they'll go do, back and do that at some point in time. They should. All right. Anyway, watch House of the Dragon. I think it's really good. Um, oh, by the way, I'll tell you one thing. I'll give you one burn. I'll give you one burn on get on uh, House of the Dragon, though. <laughs> Mate, they are almost doing Marvel-esque turn to the camera and wink when they keep doing on these last two episodes. Like, wait a minute. He told you about that? A song of ice and fire? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we get it. We get it, bro. Yes, that is crazy. Yes, That's we crazy. get it. You, that one thing you are crowbarring a bit. You know what I mean? Like, what about that? Like, God, Remember on, the secret and the prince that was <laughs> no, promised? And, and ever, but see, I the, what I think, find so what funny about that. that was <laughs> Coming soon, TM. Like, I, <laughs> what, what I find so funny about that is that everybody hated that shit at Game of Thrones because everybody's like, oh, God, oh. it's just Jon Snow. And it was yeah. like one of the worst reveals ever. And it's, oh, I'm like, totally why, why are you reminding me about how bad that part of Game of Thrones was constantly like I know I want to I forget think, that part. Way, I even Loki do think that was the most egregious element because obviously in theory that's some like George R R Martin Star Wars sequels like oh I'm subverting your expectations. It wasn't a hero's journey because the dumb thing was if they actually had played out that hero's journey and you'd have found out why did the Night King do it? What was the army about? Why were they? About? Maybe it wasn't Jon Snow. Maybe it could have been Stannis. Or you know they were, they were doing all those interesting yeah, narratives. Yeah, yeah. That could have been really fucking epic, but they kind of just pissed that away at the end of the <laughs> yeah. threw it in the bin. Yeah, it was mad. <laughs> it it uh, it reminds me of uh, <laughs> the 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 winking part of that reminds me of uh, 
you and I were talking about this recently. So I rewatched the Troy director's cut. And oh, at sure. the end of Troy, when they're like running out of Troy and uh, <laughs> the the people are escaping oh, Troy and they're so like, they're like Odysseus, right? No, no, like, no. Aneas, they're, they're like, they're like what's right? your name, boy? And he's like, Aeneas. And I'm like, oh, oh God. Yes, yes. <laughs> for the Iliad, sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, for, for the, um, for the, the Aeneid. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's like, it's like, it was just oh, so cringe. Like it was sent for sequel, wasn't it? It was like, they were yeah. like, who are you? Like, oh, I'm just, exactly right. <laughs> it was I think really it's so we're, we're making it all tangent. The other reason I also think that movie is good is because, bro, because it ends on the actual thing from the end of the Iliad. That ending is mad powerful. Where it does that thing about like, I was, I was in the days of Hector and I can, that's a yeah, fucking yeah. mega speech at the end. Sure, B kills that shit, mate. What a great ending. Yeah. So, well, not the Achilles Briseis weird love story and that's like just Achilles just like dies trying to save her stupidly. And like, I'm like, really? That's how you want to get anyway. But most of that movie is actually very good. I, the first like three quarters of that movie is actually really good, I think, especially the director's cut. Um, so shout out to Troy. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, the ending is fucked, but uh, most of it's good. And all the actors are crazy good in it, too. Although I heard, I read that Peter O'Toole was very angry that he was in that movie because he thought it was bad. <laughs> it was one of the last movies okay. he did before he died. He had a great performance in it, though. <laughs> also, just completely random, but the woman who plays like the slave girl of Achilles looks very much like the Alison Doubt of fucking House of the Dragon. Mm. Isn't her, but she looks really like that actress, <laughs> doesn't she? I think I even mistook that actress at one point because it was the, similar, the one that was in Damages later, if people remember. It was like another famous one that just looks the same, same person, basically. Anyway, that's enough. Pop culture. Back to <laughs> League of Legends. <laughs> we we accidentally uh, started talking about something that the Saudis haven't taken over yet. I'm sure it's just a matter of time, though. <laughs> the Hollywood studios are next. I'll just wait until they buy HBO. <laughs> House of the Sod. <laughs> um, we should probably talk about G2 a little bit because a lot of European fans are going to be curious yeah. about you know, their performance, especially because they did actually beat top esports at MSI. And there's probably a lot of people who are not super excited about G2's performance. And I had a lot of questions on my stream tour. And like, do I think that Liquid would beat G2 if there was a lower bracket? My I'd answer love is to see the match. Yeah, I would love to see it. My answer is probably yes, that Liquid would win win that match. But this is really just not G2's meta, you know. Yike, we, we said this coming in. Yike was never like the AP jungle guy outside of like Lilia and Ivern. They haven't looked super comfortable um, when it came to a lot of, I mean, outside of Caps on Tristana, which was obviously very good uh, at MSI. He was one of the highest performers. But G2 did at least seem a little bit out of sorts, you know, in the early stages of LEC and then also coming into this event like there were some weird things you know they were giving over the Tristana again you know top esports basically just got like Trist Ezreal Leona for free this entire tournament because they had a better meta read and credit to them like Mako had a fucking amazing event when playing okay. Leona. He, he was he great. He was actually a bit shit at my side, but he was really good here yeah. It was really good Um, I mean he, he absolutely got helped majorly in terms of winning game one against Gen G and like fighting their way back in with the Leona plays. So, you know, I, I think like it, again, it was partially the meta read, but it was also the preparation and like the meta for top esports. The fact that cream, you know, a big part of their performance is also creams oh, performance like, compared up, to like MSI. He looked yeah. really nervous and like weird yeah. at MSI. He looked much more like we see him in the LPL here. Also a great metaphor, of course, is Yone is legendary. Um, just incredible mechanics on that champion. He gets to play, you know, the Tristana. His, I mean, it's LPL Corky, so it's maybe, maybe not top tier. But a lot of the champions that he's, like, really good at were available for him at this event. Um, so I think this, this mostly felt really good for top esports and G2, like, I mean, the LeBlanc was like, I, I was confused as to why people were banning LeBlanc against Faker. Like something weird must have been happening in scrims early in this tournament, because when we saw those first games and like BLG is, is coming out, were they the ones with the LeBlanc ban? Oh, no, I think it was in the finals. Sorry. Um, Or is Liquid with the LeBlanc bans? I'm like, what has been happening in scrims? Because like T1 has not been playing this domestically. And that has really been like a rookie thing in LPL awesome. and an LPL thing. Or it was an LEC thing where we saw a lot of these LeBlanc bans. So I thought that was a little bit weird. Um, but G2, Caps has been successful in that champion. Try and come out with it again. 
Um, and they, they, I think they really got out drafted. Like they wanted the rumble, but three, they didn't ban Kennan. So three, six, nine's Kennan comes into play. Um, and yeah, so I think I'd, I wouldn't be too worried about G2. Again, this is a very strange meta where we're going to see a lot of, we're going to see a lot of movement already. You know, the patch notes have come out for 1414. Um, I think they'll probably have to nerf champions like Tristana potentially even more. But I don't think Riot's goal is like tons of farming AP junglers and Tristana, who is just completely she's just completely ridiculous. Like she shouldn't be able to get priority in lane, easily split push, especially with teleport, take down a tier two turret in three seconds and then get 700 local gold in a side lane from that and then be one of the strongest duelists in the game, be able to reset buffer out of any cc so you can't gank her you can't punish her over extensions in the side lanes very easily um she can clean up any team fight like she's just really broken right now um and like that's also why it's so mad that trophy gave it over it's like bro you would dominate on that champion that would be like unbeatable not only that but be unbeatable he literally for the like, genji literally first picked <laughs> Corky on blue side instead That's of first picking Tristana. I, I was like, what do you, well, what is this? <laughs> like, if you know how that, it, like, I, it, for you guys who are critical of Genji, what I would encourage you to do is now having watched all of this event, go back to that first game, those first two games, and look at Genji's priority. Like, look at oh, Genji's metal. priority. I would argue, at least in Genji's case, too, that. The Twisted Fate wasn't even good prior to this patch because what ended up happening is in LCK, when T1 was just blinding Twisted Fate all you know all the time, it worked at first because they were able to create picks with it. Like the Twisted Fate would get into the back line and land a gold card and then be able, like the rest of the team would be able to catch up. It worked okay. The problem is, is that the longer we kind of got on into this meta, the more we got to see engaged supports and engaged junglers or junglers that had a lot of AP with crowd control. And so Twisted Fate just goes into the back line and he either gets peeled, like you literally can't do... Okay, so for example, there, these are like the three things that could happen, basically. So you you port into the back line and what do you find? A Corky and Ezreal. Well, they just Valk or Arcane shift away. Like they have movement abilities that get them out of danger from the Twisted Fate. Or... You get hit by a Glacial Prison from Sejuani, or you get punted out by an Alistair, or you get chain CC'd by a Leona, right? Or you get arrowed by an Ash. Like, there's too much crowd control that could just instantly CC the Twisted Fate. And then there, or, you know, Maokai just Ws him, right? So there were just too many ways to play against TF in some of these team fights, and you couldn't be as aggressive as we saw earlier this year of how Zeus was playing it and how T1 was playing it, where he would just, like, or even Keen was playing it, where he just poured into the back line. And like, what a whack ass read on this meta where Genji ends up with like a top side consisting of Hui, Lee Sin, and, and Twisted Fate. Like, those feel like champions from two months ago, not from right that's now. Ridiculous. Yeah. Yes. And so, I also think like that's that's why one thing I am glad about this event and the fact that there was more chances to compete. It's a bit like the cream angle. It just allowed the top esports people to not be considered shit until they go to worlds. Like they get also, by the way, it's a lower pressure tournament. So one of the things I've always thought is very unfair in league is when you get to the international tournament, it's always the highest stakes possible. Whereas the whole thing about other open circuit games is like, for example, in, in Counter Strike right now, the team that was ranked number one is Mouse Sports because they won two events, but they were smaller events without giant crowds. So what you got to see there is people say they choke on the big stage but you get to see when they play on the smaller stage that they are really good so now you get to know right now it isn't just their skill level it's that they have to overcome the psychological end. that becomes the narrative so i think you saw first of all with cream also with mako but then also you just look like when they actually had the team set up which they didn't always have it fucking msi like bro that fucking gen g game where jackie loves on ash it's a fucking master class this is fucking mega this is what you want to see when people are telling you these players are the best in the world that you can see it when you watch these games same with 369, he had a massive glow up as well. He didn't really turn up as much at MSI. Like, I thought this was a great chance for some of the other teams to show off, including well, Team 1. Team 1 also got to look way better. I mean, it's also true that at MSI, I think both top esports and T1 were hurt by lane swaps. Um, they Especially oh, sure. 369 was not good at lane swapping. Um, and so in spite of all of 369's other strengths or all of Zayas' yep. other strengths, I don't think that they adapted to the lane swap meta particularly well. And so that was 
a point where you know there there could be redemption for both of these teams in a meta where lane swaps were less common also i mean credit to t1 they even adapted very well to lane swaps occurring so for example you know we can, we got to see uh Zayas playing the vein top into Cassante at msi well all of a sudden he's playing the zeri top now and we all know that one of Guma's problem champions has been Zeri, and so not being able to play it is a pretty big deal in Zeri betas, where Zeri can be an extremely dominant champion. And to T1's credit and to Zeus's credit, in their first series when they debuted this in game number one, they won the game, but they got lane swapped into, and he was playing Barrier Zeri, and it was very difficult to play out that lane swap scenario without TP. By the time... You know, they get to the series against Team Liquid. He's in that same matchup versus Cassante, a switch to TP. Team Liquid, you know, then the lane swap comes through again, but Zayas has more options in order to, uh, you know, in order of how to deal with it. And people will also criticize Zayas because they'll be like, well, why was he like TPing in some of these situations and dying? Let me explain lane swaps to you right now. When you are in a lane swap situation and you push in on second or third wave and there's a giant, you know, minion wave crashing into your turret, what the bot lane does. So oftentimes what you're doing is your jungler is on your strong side with your duo lane. So let's say that, you know, you've lane swapped. So you're 80 carry and supporter in the top lane. Your top laner is also there pushing. So you have three people under the turret and you probably have a jungler on that same side of the map as you. So there's four players from one team on that side of the map. Now what happens is there is a mind game that occurs, which is the a, the support and AD carry can leave lane and go into a brush. And what they'll do is they'll start channeling their recalls and they'll wait to see if the TP comes through. And sometimes they stop and they'll restart their recalls again. So you actually just can't know whether they're there or not. And as a top laner, you just kind of have to be like... I really could use that giant wave of experience that's crashing into my turret. They've been gone for like 15 seconds. Is it safe to go? Now, sometimes it is, and they've recalled and they're heading back into bot lane. Sometimes they're just still there and you get dove and you die. And that's just how it is. But like to blame a lot of the top laners, and there's a price to that, which is their bot lane has to stay there in order to complete that dive and they don't get down. So maybe you get more turrets in the bots or more plates rather in the bot side. So there are costs to this, but everybody's like, how dumb for that player to TP. And it's like that player couldn't have known because they literally, th those, the other players have been off the map for 15 seconds and sure they could be there, but they could have all, if you don't catch that wave and they're not there, then you just fucking lose a ton. Right? So it's a hard situation. And lane swaps just still, work uh, that way uh, now. Well, have you ever considered that a lane swap actually is when a Scion invades and then goes <laughs> back to lane and just finds it in the top laner? Because Double Lift, most decorated player in LCS history, did tell me that's what a lane Famous swap Famous esports World Cup co-streamer. <laughs> Love it. By the way, I'm not even joking on that one, by the way. I, I bring that up as an obvious contrast to the bouse. But, bro, I don't think anyone's mad at Double Lift. Well, if you're not mad at Double Lift, why are you mad at anyone? <laughs> why, why was anyone? Why would anyone who didn't virtue signal get this shit then? Like, why would Dego get shit if, if double lift's fine? Why is Dego? By the way, I'm gonna guess what, what the money he made off the core stream. Fucking double lift got more than Dego for this event, you idiots! Like, <laughs> double lift probably made fucking like twice as much as Dego. What are you talking about? Especially if you ran ads. <laughs> probably not wrong. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think. You know, I think this, I'll, I'll bring it back to the original topic, Monty. The downside is this a mixture of current LEC form and this tournament just makes you unfortunately have to temper the narrative that a G2 exited MSI with. They exited MSI with a narrative that said they actually did potentially outplay T1 in two best of fives and Caps was better than Faker and he holy was. shit, they're all taking turns to peak in different games and maybe this is like we're saying one notch below G2 2019. Maybe this team can like go to Worlds and bro, maybe they could be in the semis. Maybe they can fuck around and like actually beat like an LPL team go to the final like maybe they could be like way but, but the problem is after you watch these last two you just go oh, okay bring it back down a bit bring it back down a bit let's see when they get to worlds because I, I agree with you it's also patch dependent clearly they're clearly not just something that can master every patch and be the best and uh, yeah there was a drop off at this event yeah and look there was a drop off from Fnatic too and if we want to talk about teams yes. with fucking Big whack time. ass meta reads can we discuss how the way, they... if we're going to talk about tournaments counting let me just check everyone watching do you this is a floor chart do you think this tournament counts for T1 and Genji if so shut the fuck up about humanoid <laughs> 
Stop <laughs> telling me he just carries all the time and that he's like the fucking second coming of cat. He isn't. Like, bro, this guy just has mad games he phones in and just shit. And also, bro, I'll tell you what people need to start calling out with Humanoid. He has some outrageous sins. He has some of those criminal ones where you just walk up and just die. You're like, you're like what are you doing? Or well, you just face check and fucking brush or something. Like, what? It's even worse <laughs> because those moments often come when he has a bounty on him and he's like yeah. really far ahead. And then he just dies, gives up the bounty, yes. and then all the hope of winning the game goes out the no, door. No, I was saying it's, it's forthcoming, but on Best Damn League Show, I made the point that in some ways, Humanoid also has that Nisky thing where once he gets a lead, and my joke was he's like an English gentleman. He's like, you got to give him a sporting chance. You know, give him a chance back in the game. Like, he's fucking doing that all the time. I'm with you. Where's the difference is? If you want to contrast him, bro, this year especially, when Caps gets a lead, he closes the game, mate. He's really good at that now. Yeah, I don't know. It, 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 look, Fnatic also, like, if we want to talk about wacky meta leads, they came into this event knowing, as everybody does, that APA plays Ziggs. And they're like, what's so crazy to me, Thorin, is like, Team Liquid is very good at macro, but they do it in particular ways. And they did it to T1. You'll notice that they still play Udyr when many people don't, because one thing that Team Liquid does really well is proxy farm and turn it into a lot of pressure on the map and turn it into turrets when they have champions like Ziggs who can knock them down really quickly. Like they're very, they've been very good at this this whole year. And so when you're trying to plan against Team Liquid, I wouldn't say that like drafting a no wave clear composition, that's probably the fastest way to lose to Team Liquid. And when you have this fucking Cassidin that is just getting shoved the fuck in and APA is just wandering around the map taking all your turrets, like that is just how Team Liquid plays and you have to be able to combat that. And also to com to to pair it with a top lane Varus is just like, it was so bad, man. And then not only that, but they come into the next game and they see the they see the Jin Zhao and they're like, oh, hey, you know where we've seen this before? Well, remember when Canyon in the LCK finals of spring played the, the Kha'Zix into the Jin Zhao? Now is the time. Like, guys, that was that was months ago. Like, please stop. I don't even think it was good at the time. I don't even think it was good when Canyon did it. Like you guys remember the joke it because Monty, what they did is because it was a short term event, and sometimes aside from the first opponent, you weren't sure who you'd face next. Obviously, the analysts had a limited amount of time; they didn't have days and days like other tournaments. So what they did is they used that new Google AI because the joke is it keeps doing all these things where it's saying all the wrong information. Monty, yeah, yeah. so the joke is what they did is when they Googled t priority faker, it was like LeBlanc. He, is, he was one of the greatest. Step. Like okay, get the LeBlanc pan in. Then they were like, oh shit, get that. Better get that Kazakh's pick. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> but this it's this is an old info. <laughs> but if you if you guys, this is why this tournament is so fucking wacky. You know, it's like, wh why are we seeing this stuff? I don't think Fnatic's coaches are dumb. I don't think their players are dumb. I don't think Gen G has dumb players or coaches. I do think that Gen G was way too cocky coming into this event. Like, they clearly just thought they would walk over everybody and could do whatever the fuck they wanted and just resorted to, like, some weird-ass comfort picks and then lost. Um, but, I mean, when you're when you're looking at these teams, it's like, well, this is what happens when you have just played domestically. You're focused on your domestic competition. It's not like Counter-Strike where there's, like, a tournament and then there's three weeks of break and then another tournament. It's like, oh, no, okay, so it's, some of these teams were playing on, like, Sunday, and they were in Saudi Arabia for a tournament that started on Thursday on a completely new patch with no time to scrim. And of course, and then also, as you pointed out, Thorin, the fucking like rigged ass bracket where you don't even get good seeding. So it's like you can't even get a, a if you're an Asian team, if you're Gen G, you can't even get It'll the freebies. Like Gen G should have been up. playing FlyQuest literally yes. in the first match. That's obviously how real seeding would work. Come on. <laughs> right. You know, and so it, I hate and it's it like, to say that's reasonable. It, you know, all of the matches should have been Asia versus the West. And like yep. in that scenario where all of the teams have, I, I would say an easier, all the Asian teams have easier first round opponents. By the time they get to the semifinals, they've at least had four best of threes to look at to determine some level of priority and like play style. Um, and top esports, to their credit, did a lot. Like I think, I think top top esports and T1 had very different routes through this tournament. Top esports had a very good read on this meta, and then T1 just was like, "Well, fuck it, we just do pick comps." Well, we're going back to that, right? <laughs> and other teams, like you know, they Gen G, I think, especially in game one, tried comfort and they're like, "It doesn't matter. We've got a Fed Karthus. We're going to win this no matter what." And top esports just outplayed them. Um, 
And then game two, they're like, we got all our comfort picks. It's like those picks aren't even good anymore, Gen G. And like, I don't even know what Fnatic was doing. It was like they were trying to like galaxy brain the team liquid but it's like just don't give him fucking zigs you know what i mean there there are the picks way, that really enable team liquid's play style even though by saying this i'm actually arguing against what i like and what i consider the best format in league i have to say this also shows why i also mentioned in the past we don't have to only have be a one or best of five Best of three gives you a way bigger chance for the upset, especially in a game like League where you can have a Baron flip or something on the game three. Like, if you ever wanted upsets, which in theory fans do, best of three tournament's also a great way to do it. Like, again, like, th there's another thing you can't do if you're Gen G. If it's a B05 money, you can start game one, the classic Korean style, let's feel out their picks, see what their price is. You can't do that in a B03. In a B03, you've got to get cooking from game one. You've got to try and win 2 0. Yeah. So if you want upsets, I tell you what, if you make a bunch of international tournaments with BO3s, the team looking to the G2s the world will actually occasionally upset and get a win over the top team. It'll happen. The, the thing about BO3s is that I don't mind BO3s. Obviously, if they're in double elimination, I especially don't mind them. But even okay. I don't even mind single elimination BO3s if we have a lot of international events in the calendar. Yes. The, the problem yes. is, is like, why single elimin BO3s are fucking terrible is because we have two international events in the League of Legends yes. calendar Great. and that's it. So like the only chance to see these teams is in is in like bad formats. So we have to have the most robust formats. Like I didn't really care like Thorin, sure, it'd be cool if this event was in another week, but it's fine with me that it's done. You know what I mean? Like by the way, actually, personally, again, if we're talking about circuits, because I come from Couch, dude, I'll oh, quick. I love a one week event. Now, look, you could you could absolutely fit more games in if you'd had the whole week and you do, you know, you could have also done more with format. But the reason I like the one week tournament, well, this is why actually I've always said this, I've said it to you before. I do think, obviously, yes, everyone knows Couch Strike is a more easy game and intuitive to understand. But I actually think what people miss that they're getting hyped about when they watch like the major isn't the game. Because remember, a lot of them don't actually appreciate Couch Strike enough to know all the nuance of what's going on. I think what they're loving is tournament formats. Tournament formats are the best thing in esports. They're fucking dope. And when you get to follow a storyline where a Monday, Day the tournament begins, and by Sunday you're in the final, but it's between that, and every day you're getting to wake up and watch the next. I love that fucking vibe, even though I agree, league actually quite uniquely can be benefited, especially domestically, from having the week to prep for the finals because you can come up with so many interesting things, getting a lot. But at the same time, if you want just competition, narratives, excitement, these tournaments like a week long, it can be a perfect length if you do it right. I'd be up if you had like three, four more of these, and you know, I would fucking love League of Legends, mate. It would be my shit, right? And also, I think people. The reason why this tournament was exciting was because there were upsets in the first round. And yes. I mean, imagine, put this in your brain, guys. If Team Liquid hadn't been good at this event, would this have been a good tournament? The answer is no. Like, basically, if teams had performed as expected, this would not have been a good event. It would have just been Gen G steamrolling everybody and then maybe T1 or BLG in the finals and Gen G destroying them. Like, that was the expected result. Yes. We didn't expect like T1 to almost lose to Team Liquid. Yeah. Right. We didn't expect T1 to have a quite good champion diversity and pull out a variety of interesting strategies. Right. We didn't expect oh, look, Top Esports to have can, a very if good game. If they had been in that semis, they would have been murdered by T1. Like that wouldn't even have been a good game, mate. That would have been <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Sam, were you? T1 actually sort of, TL sort of saved the, TL saved the interest tournament. of the semis for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like those semis were supposed to be dog shit guys. And they were, they were actually kind of interesting because of team liquid. So, yeah. um, uh, nearly quite nearly very interesting. I mean, what, and I, I don't think it's outrageous Thorne, to even say that like in a theoretical universe, team liquid could have won this event. I'm not convinced that by the time top got to that best of five, that they would have definitely beaten TL. I think it's a bit of a reach to think TL could win three out of five games against superior players. But I will say, just to be a prick again, I'll look back to my old narrative. Remember the NRG narrative? Let's stop importing players. I mean, why would we want Impact, Umpty, and Core JJ? They're not doing anything. Get in fucking Busio and Snipe. Shut the fuck up. That was a one team, but that, by the way, isn't even good now in the LCS. Meanwhile, what a surprise. You mean one of the best teams ever from NA has all like imports and world champion Koreans? Fuck it. Dude, they have two world champion <laughs> Koreans in this team. And you've got to out there saying, stop importing players to LCS. Do you not want to see them win games? Like, this is, spoiler, this is how you win games. Like, by the way, what some of the best results ever were because of Core JJ. That's what that MSI final's from. Like, you're an idiot if you argue against the importing because, like, <laughs> the, there's no funnel. The funnel's a drip, isn't it? Like, again, Parler Fox was nice at that tournament. He wasn't so dope now, though, is he? He's gone back to just being sort of good, but not amazing. 
Well, the other thing too is like, sure, FlyQuest I think performed obviously better than they did at MSI, yeah, but yeah. their MSI was super dog shit. So that's not saying a lot. And my question for FlyQuest is, if you can't beat G2 now, when yeah, can you yeah. beat G2? When is yeah. it going to happen? When? Yeah. Right, like, they, were, they were there for the taking. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, really? Like you, you think you're gonna, you, you think you're gonna encounter this iteration of G two? Because I promise you, when we get back to a more normal meta, like G two is definitely going to be doing better. And also, G two is a team that they thrive on prep. Guys, G2, they they fucking love prep. They're one of the best teams in the world with prep. Like, if you give these guys a month to cook in a boot camp, that's when the fucking, like, level ones come out. That's when the the Mickey X, like, wacky supports come out. That's when we get Halo Blades Poppy. That's when we get them, like, warping the meta and figuring out all these angles. Like, G2 is going to be most vulnerable in a short week when you when you have these, you know, on a new patch. Like, you don't let G2 cook too long on the same bat. Sometimes they overcook, right? They do some really weird shit. But, like, this is the most vulnerable G2 is going to be because they're not going to be this vulnerable at Worlds. I will tell you that right away. By the way, I even have a theory like that about Liquid and why they're so good. Because I actually get the sense when they did whatever boot camp they did for MSI and when they played the teams there in the scrims, I actually imagine, considering they have such good fundamental macro and the team is well-drilled and they play a limited champion pool, but they play around it for all the comps, etc. I actually think they're probably one of the few Western teams that benefited from scrimming. Because, you know, the story I've mentioned a million times has been corroborated in all my interviews. The real problem with Worlds is that two-week boot camp where if you are like a TSM with double lift and Bjergsen and you just won from brute force handsing people, you spend two weeks getting murked for two weeks you just get shit on by all the top Asian teams sometimes as the joke goes in 2018 challenger teams that you just don't know are going to become damn one and griffin are sm smoking you and you just think fuck am I shit so by the time you even play game one you're already like well, how can I possibly win whereas what liquid does isn't about hands so as a result what they do is replicable they're learning I'll, yeah. I'll bet in some of their scrims they're outmaneuvering some of the teams if they play like the fucking fourth oh, yeah. best LPL team they probably beat them why wouldn't they you know yeah, I think they're really like legitimately quite good now, especially in terms of fundamentals. And it's one of those teams like BDS where the meta can change, but like the map awareness and the cross mapping and like there's always going to be some champion that you can get some, you know, priority or fast pushing with for the most part. Um, or you can just collapse faster into a side lane with global ults or like Aurelian Soul Dragonflight or throwing a Ziggs Bomb or a Talia Wall, you know what I mean? So, like, it feels as though this Team Liquid team is just very well drilled in fundamentals, and it's not that they play the same style as BDS, because they don't, they're not like an objective control team, they're more of a pressure team, but they do what they do very well. Also, even though this is totally irrelevant, and it's an insane reach, and it's just self-aggrandizement, it's summoning insight. So I'll just say, technically, you can thank me for Team Liquid's results. Because if it wasn't for me, they always had spawn around this team for years, by the way. But they were wasting their time putting, like, Jat as the coach. Well, you know what? You can thank me for that. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I cleared that one up for you. In the same way as you can enjoy the new EG CEO, you can thank me for that also. So it's all I'm just here to do my service to the community. <laughs> when, when can you get rid of the Esports World Cup, Thorin? Can you do that one? That might I'm be out of your power. No, exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, look, I think, I think this event as a whole, obviously we talked about at the beginning, the viewership went incredibly well. It was weird. It was WWE seating. Um, but it did feel good to have another international event and I did enjoy watching the games. So I was much oh, more interested in this it. than more domestic competition. I'll tell you that. When you look at the bracket, it was easy to be cynical, but then the first results were literally the two top teams from MSI being eliminated immediately. <laughs> so immediately you knew, holy fuck, it's open. Like this, this is wide yeah, open yeah. now. If, if these teams are all good, anyone could win. Except for Fnatic. Well, yeah, so. <laughs> They're the only one who can't, can fly. They obviously can't go if you couldn't win. But, you know, if you were TL Gen G, uh, if TL Top Esports GT, you had to think you had a chance. Yeah. You could win with a chance then, yeah. Especially with the money. You know, another oh, the wacky... Problem is they will 
playing the goat. And you know the thing about Tom Brady, I mean Messi, I mean Faker, is you just can't beat the goat, baby. It doesn't matter, by the way, if they have better players around them, if they play unique stuff. No, 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 it's just the goat. You have to understand, you could put Faker on Team Liquid now and they'd win Worlds. What are you talking about, Monty? That's the way the game works. He's the goat. He's the goat. Meh. He's the goat, man. What are you talking about? It doesn't, doesn't matter if he's lost his last four <laughs> no, domestic it titles. Uh, it doesn't matter well, that he lost yeah, MSI on, and Worlds. Online. I took a comment from Reddit that at the time had like 190 points and it goes like someone, uh, someone before it goes, Faker is still the goat, you know, Faker is still doing goat things. And a guy goes something like, Faker is so underrated, he has a champion ocean. <laughs> In 2024, Monty, they said Faker has a champion ocean. He plays Yone now. So Don't worry insane. about it. Bro, he has like a he has a fucking champion Panama Canal. That's what he has. Like, what are you talking about? He's literally the most champion pinch player in their team. Are you ready, Monty? Buy his team. His own team champion pinches him. Like, what are we doing? But and also that, even though I'm joking, that also looks like match fixing. Like, ban LeBlanc against Faker. Like, what year is this? Holy shit. It's 2015. He's undefeated on LeBlanc again. Just pick more. Ghana. It's so bad. <laughs> um, it's so bad. Yeah, like that. That one was. I, I. They must have had like some info about scrims. Like he, he, LeBlanc must have been like fucking tearing up scrims there in Saudi Arabia sure. because that was incredibly weird. Uh, that they would just come out with that ban of all things. I mean, he literally hasn't played LeBlanc this summer. <laughs> He's played it once this year. And he lost, right? It's I feel like I feel like he was pick. only even good. Like we're gonna probably have to go by like twenty twenty two spring no, or something no, no, when he was decent well, on that. Well, when he was, right? Oh, when he was good on it. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean LeBlanc has been good she recently, go obviously with the static shift stuff. No, but, no, like, no, it was like Night Omega on it, yeah. But no, yeah, he, it, it wasn't when Faker him. was years and years now, years <laughs> since he was good on that. Yeah. He he played it two times last year. He's played it three times in the last two years. So I don't know where that was fucking coming from. That was very weird. They must have encountered some, like, they must have been, like, scrimming Caps or somebody, and Caps must have been trashing them with it, they must have thought. But I, I, that was I, that was really out of left field. This feels like a wasted ban, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it's <laughs> so, so much more you could have done with that. <laughs> the, the funny thing is they, like, kept banning it, too. So maybe they, maybe they know something I don't know. The worst of all time, easily, because I have to say, if you're Riot, this does just show you didn't do a great job with the champion diversity, is when you look at that page, Monty, and it shows that Faker has played 174 Azir games. Oh, yeah. It's like... <laughs> it's his most you played, played by a lot have now. the audacity to complain about Froggen, and this, your goat just played Oriana and Azir, like it's all career, basically, like, this game is a fucking... I like, I like Azir. <laughs> nah, it's bullshit, mate. It's bullshit. No, you can make At plays. least it's more balanced. I hated it, though, when it, like, won lane, had priority, and then it also wins all the team fights, and you can just escape. It's like, how many more fucking things does it need? And you what can split push. It was gross, yeah. It was gross, mate. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um... But in general, like I think the the kit and mechanics of Azir are quite interesting. And They're I fixed I mean, it a bit now. It's more plausible, I, yeah. Obviously, Faker's like Azir performance at World and like that crazy shuffle he did too. The, the playmaking ability is really what what makes the champion yeah. interesting. Uh, you have any other final thoughts on the esports World Cup? We're we're back into domestic play coming up this next week. Like I say, I I actually just enjoyed the tournament. I'm just I actually I love little tournaments like this. I prefer a, a tournament circuit. So sure, for yeah. me, it's just a positive. I actually hope like next. Like by the way, those suggestions for next year sound great. I'm up for them. Let's do three internationals. <laughs> by the way, as you say, you can even burn one on a famous draft if you want to make it a gimmick. Okay, that's cool. As long as we get the other two as well. I mean, I I honestly, if if I am looking at this not from a gross Saudi takeover of esports perspective, but merely from a fan perspective, and all of my theories are correct, which is like it's actually I am Katowice again, and we get and it's it's back with this level of production from the esports World Cup, except it's the MSI format, and then Riot produces worlds. Like I'm not angry at that as a viewer. And also, right. by the way, you will just get more viewership overall, like international viewership. Too. It'll make the, it'll make, by the way, it's already the biggest game anyway, but it'll be, just be the biggest. This is why I always thought, even when it was the biggest game, it's like you could have blown it out, though. You could have destroyed all those games like Daughter and CS if you'd have done this style of tournament, though. So I think it's great, yeah. 
Just ignore the Saudi shit. But then again, that's sort of the message of this whole thing, <laughs> that's, it? that's the exact message. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so bad. The Saudi stuff really isn't so bad when you think about yeah. their cool esports tournaments, is it, Thorin? <laughs> Listen, mate, when Israel's dancing around, I'm not even thinking about people being killed. I'm just going, wow, I hope he hits the arcade shift, you know. <laughs> oh, man. It's sad. Uh, all right. Any other, anything else before we hit viewer questions? No, I think we're all good. All right. Well, we will take a quick break, guys, for viewer questions, and we'll be back then. This is going to be the viewer questions segment of the show that we always end with. So, of course, the question is, how do you, a viewer, submit a question? Well, it's one of the perks of supporting Last Free, Network, Last Free Nation Network. So, basically, if you subscribe to our Discord, the Last Free Nation Discord, then you will have access to a channel where you can submit a question. And actually, if you notice at the moment, we're doing a pretty good job. I think we've got through nearly all of them for like three weeks in a row or something. So oh, yeah. We, we, we generally all of last week. Them. Yeah, we generally get through them. All right, first up, do either of you like to collect anything? I'm not really a collector do you, do you have that impulse i do but here's the thing it's in a very very weird specific way that doesn't seem to be like anyone else like i literally do collect books comics sure. i used to even by the way in the days when the internet speed was i used to hoard loads of shit of movies and tv shows and stuff so i do collect them but here's the difference though i just do it literally for the functional thing that i want to be able to read that thing again if i decide today like i can go onto a shelf and pick up like an alamo obscure comic or i can read a book that i've already read on my kindle but maybe one day i lose my kindle you know so i want to have it in physical form too so i do it more like that but i I don't, for example, despite the fact I'm collecting comics, I don't give a fuck about mint condition or like issue one in the first print. I'm not that guy who does the first printing type thing. So I'm not really like a sort of luxury collector. I just collect for the literal functionality of being able to enjoy the content anytime I want and also lend out to people and stuff. I, I sure. enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, I have I have a lot of books too. I think in terms of collecting though, the thing I collect most is probably like esports memorabilia. Now, I do not give a shit about game IP. Like, I don't want okay. any. I literally want right. zero League of Legends like characters. But I do actually have quite a significant collection over the years, mostly of stuff that the teams have given me of various jerseys and like I have boxes and boxes of that stuff, which is actually really fun because I can pull it out and like wear it on stream or whatever. Not right now because I'm in Korea and it's all in the States. But, you know, in the past, it's been really fun to be able to pull out all that old stuff. And it's like it helps me remember, you know, big events or like points in my life. So I would say some of that esports merch is probably like the stuff that I collect most, but I, I don't really buy it. It's usually just been stuff that's been given to me. Um, I do technically collect the scalps of people who talk shit about <laughs> me on Twitter if they're famous. So that, that's kind of a niche thing. You know? <laughs> I'm on kind of a Blood Meridian type thing there. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> just to, uh, that is uh, that's a terrifying thing to be I will be the judge of I will be the judge. Would you have thrived? Just don't make the baby tree. Uh, would, would you have thrived if you were a student of Terrence Fletch Fletcher in Whiplash? Would Red Eye be the closest comparison to him in esports? <laughs> that's not a bad shout, actually. He's sort of a person that was kind of a bit like nitpicky and stuff. Yeah, he had, certainly had his own agenda and his own old school. I mean, the problem I have with that movie, Monty, is this. Essentially, I like the premise as a fictional premise. I just don't agree with it philosophically. Like, I don't think you actually have to be super horrible to people to make them excellent, blah, blah, blah. I mean, in a way, you could even say that movie should be massively appealing to league fans because that's kind of what they do in China and Korea to make <laughs> their players mega. But as a result, they do absolutely break people's just brains. CV them out. Yeah, it's really wild. So the problem I have with it is if I accept the premise of the movie and I go into that world, I do think it's a great movie. I think the brilliant performances by the two central actors, obviously. But I do, essentially, the problem I have is I just don't agree agree like i actually think they push it too far like for example that scene he has monty early on where he like tells his girlfriend like he we just have to break up now because you'll just like resent me and i'll never have any time for you it's like that's not really true like at the end of the day you can always still make a little bit of time each day for your loved one like you don't have to actually yeah. be a monk you know like i appreciate <laughs> the extremity of it being a movie and fictional premise but, so i don't know about that would, would you have thrived if you were a student of terence Lutcher? i think i would do fine honestly i don't i, think I would do it. badly actually because my problem <laughs> is even though I now actually do sort of like understand the idea of like sublimating your ego and like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like going for a high. At the time, especially when I was young, I was very, very anti-authority. So that would, ah. I would probably be the opposite. I would be the person who quit after a week the probably, you know. The thing is, is like when I was younger, if I, I would, I was looking for, you know, teachers. And so if I mentors, respected that yeah. person, a mentor, I would absolutely do that for yeah. them. So I wouldn't do it now, but I think if I was that oh, age... 
But it is sweet. That's actually, uh, I would actually say that is one of the problems I had in my younger life. I didn't really have figures like that in my life. And so at the time, I, in a way, I was trying to be self-made, but like completely, like I'm just going to do it all myself. I'm going to figure out my own weird nation. So I do think actually, that is the central premise of the film, That even though they, they bastardize it a bit, is it's essentially that everyone great probably does need a mentor. Now that's a better line. Like I do think also, it's a passion Also, young men no in crass. particular. I would argue yeah, young men in particular. And, and purpose in the life. Yeah, of course. If people so. don't know, I actually think the most underrated aspect is the reason why purpose is so essential to men is because when you have purpose and you do something and you're good at it and it's necessary, you get conferred respect by people, your peers around you. And to me, respect is the currency that like men run off. Like if a man feels disrespected, that's the guy who's a terrorist, who's evil, who's an incel. That's the person who goes rogue and is bad for society. The man who feels like he has a place and a purpose and respect on any level that you can live off that i think that's like that's like the lifeblood of a man in my opinion <laughs> if you want to see maybe the worst example of the griefing i am holding against faker watch from the 22 minute mark of game two versus bro from today well we can't do it right now faker legitimately is inting like that at least once a series at this point it's actually costing his team's games the bo3 is that he does this is just a is this just a rant <laughs> uh they should make the event a full week i'm sure they wanted to it wasn't look let me explain what EWC was. This was an audition for ESL to host MSI next year. The only th it didn't matter if anybody watched it. The only thing that mattered is that the production looked good and the event went reasonably without hitches, which it did. The last part is the key part, Monty. It's actually genius to make it four days, single limb mini yes. BO3s because it's a chance you can fuck it up. As you say, yes. the main goal here was get to the end and have all the matches and not make yep. it like rule over time. And as, yes. that's what, Yeah, I agree. You, it's next year if you get the gig, you do whatever you want to do and you do the big format. Yeah, I'm with you. Like literally... It, it went very well by all standards, it, unless you're Jacob Wolf and think that League of Legends is in a terrible place in terms of viewership or whatever the fuck he thinks. Um, and like for the purposes of this, this is a long term plan from the Saudi government. And this was just the first this is the first checkpoint to a very long race that is going to get more impressive. So it doesn't matter. Also, by the way, I'll just point out for the millionth time, Monty. Dear Jacob Wolf, I don't want to hear, nor do many people in esports, you comment on people who've made large investments and didn't get much viewership on their media in exchange for it. You fucking lack of self-awareness, idiot. Think it through, bro. Think it through. You aren't the guy to call that out. You ain't him. You can't do it. <laughs> He's so silly and he, whatever. Luckily, I just set the comment. On him, he's one of those people. I set the filter to comedy and I just enjoy it. You know what I mean? I just, I, get, I just enjoy it. Like, he's a character from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. So I just enjoy it. Man. I just get into it. What are your favorite Hopium Twitter accounts a la dudes posting their Ws? That's a pretty good one. That's a good one. That's a really I, I, good one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't really follow many of those accounts, so I don't know the names of them. Sometimes, like, the algorithm just one. feeds me sh shit. There's one that's called, uh, I don't know if there's an actual tag, but it's the name of it. It's called, like, Nature is Amazing. It'll be stuff mm. like, you know, a bear swimming in someone's pool and getting all joyful, or, like, someone put a prosthetic onto a horse that had one leg chopped off, it's running free. Those are, I know, dogs doing cute stuff. Those, those are also kind of life-affirming. Nice. By the way, I do enjoy that stuff. The other thing I enjoy, I've even done an interview on my side channel about this, is they're a bit more limited, but they do still exist, where there's this guy, this Ukrainian guy, actually, who made a lot of art bots. And so if you're a fan of a certain person, a certain specific artist, he made the bot. So it has all of their work and even their like draft sketches. And it just like over time, it's like a script. It just posts them like regularly, like every few weeks. And so, for example, through those bots alone, Monty, because I wanted to have like a bunch of like beautiful things on my timeline too, to go in amongst all the cynicism of esports. <laughs> I actually discovered, for example, I'm not a big art fan. I actually now discovered what my favorite art period is. I like the art period and style of romanticism. So oh, a lot of like go. the Russian people, Yevazovsky or whatever they're called. It's like, you know, like a bay at night with amazing moon shining down. That, mm. I love that shit. I'm, I'm actually really into it. Was I thought before I wasn't an art guy because I just thought my, first of all, modern art is dog shit. And then I'm not even really a big <laughs> fan of like Van Gogh, for example. So when I found this is my, this is my jam, mate. I can look up those guys loads. They're mega. So I, um, I find that really enjoyable. I'll, I think you recommended this Instagram account to me, but the retro sci-fi Instagram account. That's a good one. Uh, which does yeah. a bunch of like really cool, like obviously retro sci-fi screenshots of films or anime, like retro anime. It's it's pretty cool. 
Uh, a lot I'm of, also like, a fan if people want to look it up. This isn't technically Twitter, but if we're doing anything, there was a subreddit, if it still exists, go look it up. It was called like movie poster porn. And most of it was posted by one guy. And what he would do, Monty, is he would take fan made art posters where they would reimagine Blade Runner or something. And some of those, you can imagine how talented some people are with art. Like some of those were way better than the original, mate. They were incredible. <laughs> like the fucking ones for like the Inception or something. There were some really good ones there. So yeah, stuff like that. And I do think, by the way, that is a good approach. You don't want your feed to just be all doom shit and all fucking negative. You want it to have like things that inspire you and make you remind, yeah, what, get off the computer, go and do this, or life is good. There is, like, for example, people are good. That's a good fucking message to put in people's brains nowadays. <laughs> I will be in both Amsterdam and London over the next week. What would be one must see slash must do for each city? I was going to give you museums because I fucking love museums, which is the British Museum. I was so worried that that was the setup of like, so we'll. If Thorin is in either, would you like to get a beer? No. A spoiler, I'll never be getting a beer with anyone. In fact, I'll leave the bar if I see you come in. No, in terms of music, the British Museum is the most obvious one. You know what, Monty? I'm and the, the Rijksmuseum Museum in Amsterdam is very good as well. It's pretty good. If you don't know, the Rijksmuseum Museum is one where you, you also can't go around that in one day. There's so many different yeah. like, fucking areas, and they have loads of like, naval shit, and obviously the oh, golden age of the Dutch. What's the... Actually, when I was in Amsterdam last time, I they went have a ship to museum as well. The ship museum is an absolute banger. Yes, the yeah. the galleon. That one I don't is. I enjoyed that. Similar liked that a lot because he's a big um, Master and Commander fan. Yeah, me too. Um, what is it? The National Maritime Museum in Amsterdam it's is. An right, it's literally banger. right. It's right on the opposite Central Station, and there's a big like old fashioned galleon there, so you can't miss it. You just walk yeah. around that corner. No, there's that, and then I've got a little take for you on the British Museum that a lot of people don't understand. You know, in the modern day, they malign it because they go, "The bloody Brits just stole everything. Give it all back." Right? It's great it's to see everything in one place. <laughs> Happened is they invented the field of archaeology, you cretin, in these Western countries. The other countries that they took the ship from didn't have that and so you know the most famous example is the rosetta stone the rosetta stone was being used to like prop something up in like a poor person's like home in fucking egypt and some french soldier just saw it and was like what the fuck like so essentially all those treasures it's not that they were stolen you wouldn't have them they would have well, just been lost to time or destroyed or think about isis where there's blown up statues like there's there's a period where it was almost stewardship now look you can have the debate now should they give it back but that's right. one thing i always think people malign because well, the british museum is mega it's it's it's, it's also like the Elgin marbles from the Parthenon. Yep. Um, you know, basically that the that structure because Athens didn't exist in the 19th yeah, century exactly. when Lord Elgin yep. took them. It was like yep. they were in like a middle of a field. Like the city of Athens yes. was nothing at that time, and so. What ended up happening was that actually the Parthenon was destroyed because it was being used as an ammunition cache and got hit by a shell and exploded in a war between like the Ottoman Empire and whoever yeah. else. Um, and so it was already like partially blown up. And if Elgin hadn't come and like taken the marbles, like God knows what would have happened to them because nobody was given a fuck in Greece. Now, we can argue whether who who deserves them now. Uh, but they absolutely were saved by being exported at the time. Um, well, and they are still there, the and they are understand. amazing. I'll never understand the argument, who deserves it. That's not the way humanity has ever existed on this planet for 99.9 .9 recurring. Here's <laughs> People how, don't want to hear that, how, though. <laughs> here's how reality works. Possession is nine tenths of the law. You have the guns to take it. You get to have it. So you know what? If you're even a country that did, it wasn't Greece, if you can come and beat Britain in a war and take that from the museum, you get to have it for as long as you can keep hold of it. So you know what, Greece? If you want Jesus. that, get some fucking nukes, get some submarines, get some tanks, and we'll see you on the battlefield, motherfucker. Jesus. Exactly. I'm, I'm just keepers. We're claiming that shit. Exactly. I'm, I'm spinning that whole thing. I'm fucking. I'm actually. I'm co-signing all of British history, man. I'm not against it. I'm not fucking guilty. I, that was my ancestors. We Rocking that shit, boy. <laughs> they did. Let, they level did your shit. Stop crying. Yeah, stop crying and try and change the rules. Fucking level your shit up and get in the game, <laughs> Greece. Uh, will you do a foreplay where you watch buddy cop movies? Maybe that sounds fun. That's actually, plausible. That sounds I mean, like a the good plausible. thing with that one as well is. The, it doesn't have to be the tradition. There's obviously lots of like there's that, that genre almost expands to any movie with two men going on a journey or a mismatch, right? You saw I mean, Sin films City could, could fall in into there. that technically, I guess. Sure. <laughs> Um, assemble a full roster, including head coach, to participate in the LOL Banter Championship. You could choose from all periods of the game's history. Well, Ooh, Imp has to go in okay. there for sure. Imp, Imp's Imp, AD good. Carry. Uh, let me think. I'm trying to think of people who are good. Like the problem is they're all going to go double if. But double he, he was kind of like way funny, very generic. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was way better. Let me think. I'm trying to think because there's definitely some other Koreans that were really sick with it. 
Oh, Piglet. So even though he's an ADC as well. Oh, no, no I guess I guess it probably counts as Piglet because he did better trash talk, didn't he? So yeah. who else would it be from <laughs> Korea, though? <laughs> You'd have Piglet in mid lane. He technically was in mid lane. <laughs> He did at one point for like fucking whatever it was, clutch or over the fucking, I can't remember. No, maybe it was like, when it was, yeah, I think it was one of the clutch. I think it was one of the rockets at it, right? Who else would we do for this? Oh, fuck. It's hard to actually think of him now. Dardock. do it out of nowhere, isn't it? Dardock's a pretty good one. Dardock in the jungle. Who are the best? Oh, um, obviously Perks. Yeah, true. Perks has had some good ones over the years. Um, else? I tell you Alfar? what, even though he's from the same team, I I always thought Wonder was pretty good at trash talking. Wonder, or I mean, even Alfari or Soaz, like had their had their moments. Oh, Soaz like. is up there too. Yeah, he was a good one. What about head what about... coach? The coach is really. I mean, uh, here, I will tell you the secret. The real answer to this question is Coma, but I'm out of. I hear him shit talk because he doesn't do it publicly. But just holy, publicly, right? holy smokes, right. that guy! <laughs> oh, is, it, is it like what they say about Messi in private? That like he thinks he invented the game, basically. Like, he's just no, everything. Coma's is great, it, man. Like he's that? just he's just very funny. He's just very. He talks right. bad shit though in private. It's great. <laughs> um. That's that's the sleeper pick. I, not that many coaches have done public trash talk, though. That's true. I mean, it's the main role in league yeah, that people don't do, isn't it? Is there a support player that's ever done it? Well, I'm trying to think. I get because uh, the problem is, like, even the ones Chouster? that are spicy don't necessarily trash talk. I guess he would be up there. That's up there. Because, like, for example, when I think of people spicy like Mithy, he wasn't really a trash talker, though. You know, he was more just like the a realist. Was probably just, like, the... Chouster was pretty good. I mean, remember, I think it might even have been Chouster that said the iconic line, like that, you know, like Korea will always be two years behind us or so. whatever that mad line that's like <laughs> the worst line in the history of esports. Like, whatever that one was, I think he might have said that one. That's up there. The problem is, what's bizarre, Monty, is when you consider junglers, you'd think junglers are supposed to be toxic. I can't really think off the top of my head of that many great trash talking junglers, though. Like, who would even fit the bill for that? Like, for example, like, did Meteos really trash talk? I don't know if he did. Like, I don't even think Dom even particularly did when he played. I feel like there's lots of spicy jungles, but did they ever trash talk though? I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not. I also noticed bizarrely we've got a lack of Chinese players. Where's all the Chinese players? <laughs> You'd think some of them would be. Yeah, you would think, right? Dunking on people. Yeah. I, put it this way, I guess, you know, I don't. It, that's the problem is, for example, even though Deshai said a lot of provocative stuff, did he actually trash talk? Did he actually ever really, like, put wheel down? I don't really feel like it, you know. So, I don't know on that one. It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Oh, by the way, Doinby could be on there, too. Doinby, if That's you ever true. see his opinions, there, some of them are mad. Like, he's the sort of person <laughs> who would have, like, some really crazy opinions about, like, G2 or something, you know. Yeah. He could be on there. All right, there you go. Looks looks like a lack of free speech is coming to Loli Sports as well. I typed, typed, stop jailing and killing journalists, gays, and women in the EWC oh, Twitch chat. Oh, God, wait. I missed it. Holy shit. It's obvious Diamond Prox. Oh, yeah. That's fair. Yeah, how did I miss that one? That's a good one. That's it. Man, that guy, remember, dude, one of the sickest things ever was like when he used to be the best and he used to trash talk like St. Vicious or the odd one. Oh, yeah. Bro, he used Same to was be pretty ruthless. Funny too. He was ruthless. Oh, say it was pretty good back in the day. We're going really old school. You can get up there too, mate. Joke is he was trash talking his teammates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but wait, those scrim pods back in the day the team were amazing, weren't they? Because they didn't even be winning the game, but they were just like flaming each other on the points comp the whole time. And I used to think, how could anyone play like that? But they were actually the best team. That's the bad part, wasn't it? All right, so apparently if you type stop jailing and killing journalists, gays, and women in the EWC ch Twitch chat, the message was instantly deleted and I was timed out from the chat. Of course, can Elephant and Elephant fans mess with their esports washing attempt? Yes. W what we really need to do is do this. We the, do some the, funny the, shit. We, yeah. do, we do need to do the si the bounties, the sign bounties that we always That's said we one. were going to do because actually just like giving out money to people who can get their signs on cameras at events. It might get you kicked out of the event, but if you do a good job, we'll send you money. <laughs> the only problem with that is, though, it could get you more than kicked out of the event. <laughs> well, don't do it in Saudi so... Arabia, guys. Don't, oh, but... that's, what you meant. that's what I thought you meant. Like, get no, them in no, fucking no, no, actually no. EWC to be like, I love dick. No. It's like, well, you know, like, okay. <laughs> we will not be doing that for your own okay, safety okay. at you EWC. Mean, and stuff, but right? but okay. if, you were, if you're in Sweden at an LEC yeah, final, yeah, there you absolutely. Go. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm with you on that one. Okay. Uh, you are employed at the secret T1 mind control facility. Your job is to train all Korean junglers who are being exported to other regions to throw a game upon hearing a specific sleeper agent phrase. Yep. You've cool. already successfully reprogrammed Tarzan, Kanavi, and Umti. Yes, yep. true. What is the Which phrase? Soldiers? You, what, <laughs> what, what, what is the phrase you have implanted in their subconscious to hear from their teammates with an advantageous position in a game against T1? I think we got this, guys. <laughs> Oh, 
or something like he's the goat What's or something, the code you know, word? something that activates. Can't believe yeah, exactly. we're going to beat the goat. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Wow, well, it looks like this is finally the end of Faker, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Because I tell you what, this motherfucker, he's like fucking Ra's al Ghul out of Batman. He's got like the resurrection pit, like the Lazarus pit, he just keeps coming out of. And there have been too many of those players now. There's just too many. I, at this point, Monty, like low-key, that's why I actually do want to believe in BLG because it's all Chinese. I don't have to worry anymore about that shit because I'm getting so sick of those Chinese junglers. Like, oh, well, what's that? I've lost my mind. Oh, I'm giving the whole game away. Like, fuck is this? What the hell? This is wild. <laughs> Uh, question for Thor and Monty of relevant since he mentioned it in an intro. So you apparently mentioned this in an intro. Have you watched Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, the anime? I actually have watched some of the first season. And I, 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 I will it. say it. it's one of those things I just watched when I was really high and I was just watching some garbage. But I will say, actually, <laughs> is the thing that's weird about it, Monty. I actually think you might like it because it's sort of oh, one yeah. of those things that also it's like it's like quite self-aware. Like it's intentionally really over the top and doing a lot of anime like stereotypes. And so even though it's like incredibly like everyone's really overreacting to everything, right. it's actually got like a, a decent like sort of humor behind it. I don't know if I'll watch it more, but it wasn't bad. I actually was kind of like I watched one of them randomly. I thought this isn't bad. Actually. I watched like two or three. So yeah, it's, I, it's got, I've it's been thinking about checking sort of, it out. It's pretty sweet. It's a really also like, uh, let me think I'll describe this. It's a really irreverent show. Like it's not, it's not actually just doing, playing it straight and just being really cheesy. It's like intentionally trying to like right. be ridiculous in a way and, and chew the scenery up. So you would, I, I think you would, if you try the first episode, that. you might like it actually. Yeah, you might that. like it. It's silly in a good way. What does LOL Esports look like in five years, in 10 years? Well, in five years, probably, here's what's probably going to happen, guys. Like, Literally, ESL probably is producing LCS and LEC in five years. Um, and maybe like Korea and China are still made by like the local offices of Riot. In 10 years, like eventually it's going to, you know, eventually. The, see, see, the thing is, is like a lot of the not like the Asian domestic leagues are doing very well, but LCS needs a lot of help. And I think eventually you just have to consolidate it into the Super League. You know what I mean? Like as the. We need more international events because those are the things that are doing the well. Uh, well, so either it goes into a super league or it goes into some sort of international circuit system in the long run. I think. Right, Monty gave the serious answer, so I'll give the comedic, obviously not real answer, which is if you remember that scene in the movie Team America: World Police, where they have a boy who's almost dressed like how you would dress in the nineteen twenties, a boy in England, with like a sort of like a little sailor type navy outfit, and he's walking along with like a lollipop and a little hat on Monty. And if you remember, he bumps into some people who just look like Osama bin Laden. I would say that's essentially what the uh, future of lolly spots is. That's that's you, <laughs> the Western fan and our player, walking along and seeing someone who looks potentially like Osama bin Laden. So there you go. That's that's, that's oh, the Jesus. future in five years. Enjoy. Enjoy. Uh, thoughts on the current case for Viper and Mako being both the best bot duo as well as the best player in their respective roles of all time. I think you could probably make a, an argument these days that Mako is the GOAT support at this point. Um, well, Vi yeah. Viper probably not the GOAT AD carry, unfortunately. He's just saying that because he won Worlds as well. Right. Charles. Like, here's the thing. I do think Viper's mega, but like for me, the two candidates is Uzi I and Def. They're the obvious ones for ADC, you know? Yeah, I mean, Ruler probably, getting up, probably oh, getting up there at this. Ruler probably getting up there. We'll put three. We'll make it a triumph for it. You can pick between those three. I think they're the, the three obvious candidates. You're right. Ruler should get that now. Yeah, so I think Viper's pretty far down the list. However, Mako might... I think I could be convinced that Mako is the greatest support of all time. I don't think it's unreasonable. Uh, do either of you know if Zyrene was forced out of the lull scene by Riot, or did he leave on his own terms? This Look, man, I'm not going to tell man. you that. <laughs> All right, I'll just. All right, what about this then? Let's just say, I will just say he was forced out. There you go. I, it wasn't yeah. really his choice. He fucked up. That's he was true. forced out. But it, it was unfortunately. This is where, like, definitely, there's a lot of abuse in Riot and how they treat people. But as far as I know, that wasn't even that bad a one. Like, if you knew that, it's not. But it's it's nothing. There crazy. was more to but that. If you knew story. the reasons. <laughs> but it's if that was Flashpoint and he did and he behaved that way, I'd, I'd probably say you're not invited to the next one too. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't um, think it's unreasonable when I heard the full details. <sighs> What what are your thoughts on J.K. Rowling? I don't really think about J.K. Rowling. I think she wrote some pop culture books that my generation is still weirdly obsessed with, despite them having very low literary merit. And I don't think her opinions about the world are particularly interesting either. So there you go. Like, I, I, she's not a great artist, guys. Who cares what she thinks? I just don't get it at all. Because here's the thing, Monty: when people obsess over like Star Wars. 
Yeah, I sort of get it because the original Star Wars are really good and they're really interesting and they're well written and the characters and the, obviously some of the actors are good. Itself, the problem is I was never interested in Harry Potter the books, the movies. I actually find them very mid. I just think they're all right. Yeah, like, they're very. That's mid. the sort of shit I'd watch on a plane, Monty. And by the way, that, I, I'll, I'll reference what I said earlier. The Harry Potter movies have some insane actors in, so you can tell they're not well, very they got, good. They basically movies, got you know? every good British actor who is still yeah, alive. Like Gary to Oldman, be in this one of them. <laughs> so the other, and then the other problem I have but, is this: J.K. I mean, Rowling. <laughs> they got everybody well, like Maggie Smith just fucking they got uh, I mean Kenneth Branagh they got fucking everybody like if you were a serious stage actor oh. you are in the fucking Harry Potter movies the problem I have with J.K. Rowling is I actually just don't find anything she does interesting like I actually exactly. think her world boring. building is dog shit compared <laughs> to like Tolkien or someone like my, even like her magic system doesn't really make sense like like by the way the dumbest thing she does as well is there's a million spells that are super powerful and you, you, it's like a it's like a badly written TV show you just don't use them elsewhere where they'd be OP as fuck like if this was a video game Monty the speed run would be over in like 30 minutes like there's spells that just make you succeed at what you do or like silence yeah. people forever like they just don't ever use these except like the one time or, that they're gonna use, like give me a break ar artifacts you know I mean? artifacts that let you time travel and then you just don't use them to fix the obvious shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, it's no, it is. It, it, look, it's it's a fun little world. I think. Like, I understand why kids like it. What I don't understand is why a bunch of forty-year-old millennials still want to talk about what house they are. That's what I don't understand. Like, oh yeah. By the way, there's there's all the two things as well. One, I do massively look down on morons who are like, because of her opinions, we can't support Harry Potter, but they support every other massive evil tech company that does all the other shit. <laughs> And they don't give a fuck. By the way, so the joke is the person saying that, Monty, 99% of the time describes themselves as a Marxist. I'm like, brother, you, you might want to read what Karl Marx said. Like, he said way worse shit than she did, you moron. And then also, when people get mad about what she says, this is where people have made the mistake, Monty, of thinking the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, okay, you might think I should like what she says on Twitter. No, because I know if it wasn't for the specific circumstances of how she is framed as a villain, she would be the one going against me, telling me I'm a piece of shit and I should have nothing. So you know what? She can just fucking let them fight. You know, you have a you have a nice time with Antifa, dickhead. I'll just sit over here and watch with fucking popcorn, you twat. She's also a literal billionaire, so who cares? <laughs> Do you think Riot will ever make an attempt to rectify the issue of League of Legends being so complicated it's hard for new players to get into the game? Well, we're going to find out is the answer because they keep promising that 2025 is going to be the biggest year for League of Legends yet. So right. maybe they'll make League of Legends 2 and fix that problem. I don't know. Um, for example, you think they'll implement champion rotations? Possibly. Um, they've got to do something because this is fucking ridiculous. And, the, it, you know, Riot is not dumb. They know that their new player base is dying. Uh, they've got to do something to fix it. Or they just let they or they just slowly sunset League of Legends as a game and develop new games. One of the two. Oh, I wouldn't also be surprised if Riot was so dumb they actually actively let League of Legends die. We've got Valorant, though, because if Riot does one thing, it is kill Golden Geese, mate. They are so fucking dumb for that. They are so dumb. Like, even as you're saying, Monty, we've referenced it before, but people don't give a fuck. The idea they have the gall to go... We're not really making much money off this. You shut down millions of dollars of profit from OG and you fucking idiot. How dare you say that years later? <laughs> like, guess what? Maybe don't just kill a golden goose, then later go, I don't have enough eggs. There's no eggs or golden out here. It's like, yeah, well, we had a fucking problem that solved, didn't we? We had that solved, you idiot. <laughs> Only changing at most two players slash staff. How would you make BDS into a team that can win LEC? That's a good oh, one. Oh, I'm going to hurt some feelings now. I'm going to hurt some feelings now. Because you know what the most obvious move I would make? Think even the styles of play. The first move I'm immediately doing, Monty, is nuke out Larson in. <laughs> it's not bad. Yeah, I mean, you know, and then you know, obviously move, just put caps in there too, and it'd probably be pretty well, You could do that as well. <laughs> I'm assuming I can't just already take G2 like, players. You know, I'm trying to like do if you If you literally thing. replace their solo lanes with G2 solo lanes, then you probably just win instantly. I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you a non-G2 one. Or Photon. If you replace... If you replace she I'll, I'll, fuck it, Adam can stay and be a moron, drawing attention, right? And not least because if he's in the sideline, as long as enough people come technically in the game, that does add up. I'll just say this. Take Razork and Larson and put them instead of she and Nuke, and that team would bang, mate. Uh, that would be a really yeah. good team. Um... Before starting to manage and create my game store, I started to create NA LOL esports content. However, I soon realized that interacting with some other smaller creators on Twitter made me physically ill on multiple occasions. Am I wrong to believe that staying out of the esports space is probably the best decision? No, it is definitely the best decision. Um, 
something along these lines. Don't you think that's one of the most disappointing things about the industry? Because everything's become about clout and dunking on people. Hey, that person's sort of right. Like, if you enter the streamer or the content creation world, it, it, unless you become huge, it's just about everyone shitting on everyone and being an arsehole to everyone. Like, that, that sucks. If people don't understand the way we even built this show was to expand and introduce you to Kelsey Moser and Froskor and, and these people, and pe fucking, uh, what's his name? Oh, fuck, I can't remember his name. What's the guy from uh, Clement, Clement Chu, all these people. Think sure, of all yeah. the people we've brought on this show. By the way, fucking Kedro, all these I don't know if Kedro came on, somebody said, became on Marshall. It's like, one right. of the things we tried to do was build a community of those people. Now it feels like it's just infighting all the time. Like, now it's literally people, like, soap opera, like, did you know she had an abortion? Oh, my God, an abortion. Like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> what has this become? Well, this? it's also it's also that at least back in the day when there wasn't money and there wasn't clout, people just got together to do esports stuff because it was fun and we all loved it. And it sure. was cool to meet people who are yeah. just motivated to to make cool content. Right. Like right yes. now, it's just like clout wars. So I can imagine being a minor content creator is very annoying. Um, Any games that you've been playing recently that you've enjoyed? Uh, I was actually I've been in the Battle Aces uh, beta. And it's a new RTS that's been designed by David Kim, who is one of the lead, if not, I think he was the lead designer on StarCraft 2. So, um, and it's like maximum 10 minutes long. It's mostly like micro based. Um, it's pretty fun. I think I've been playing Stellaris again. That's been fun. Uh, yeah, those are the two games that I've been playing recently. Any games you've been playing recently? I don't really play single player games, so no. I don't understand Dom's reaction when he sees a pro player make a bad mistake in game. Why does he act like he can't fathom that they would make such an egregious state mistake? Um, I can't believe our fans asking that, right? Do you know why that's mad? Because meta <laughs> contextually, do. you're, doing, you're doing the same thing. The, the biggest problem, and the difference is, people like Dom, because he was a pro, does understand this, but for entertainment, he allows himself to suspend oh, yeah. his disbelief. Essentially, everyone acts like they're the genius who can see what should be done in the game, and then we act like even the best pro players are actual cretin, knuckle-dragging morons when they don't, for example, Monty, see a jungler go through Fog of War and gank them. Because we can see it and they can't. So we all do that all the time. It's actually the flaw of being a spectator is you act like yeah. you're in the game and you're making those, but you're not. You're always in a safer position with all access to all the information. So I think it's just the nature, unfortunately, of spectating. Yeah. It's, it, it, we're on some level all doing it. We're all doing it. On Power Spike, they agreed that the loss at EWC for Gen G does not affect the Golden Road. Would you agree with that sentiment? Yes, we did. We yeah. talked about that earlier. Would you consider the tournament when talking about the win streak that Gen G? Yes, the win streak was broken. I mean, they oh, lost the, the best over, of three. Yeah. The win streak's over. That's um, fair. That's fair. But the Golden Road, it's like if it's not a major event, it it just that doesn't count for the Golden Road. Like you just have to consider yes. the level of preparation. And besides, like the win streak was going to end eventually for Gen G, right? Obviously, like it was already yes. the longest win streak in LOL history. It was already very impressive, and they lost to a good yep. team in top esports. So it's kind of whatever. Yes. Uh, how different would the history of League of Legends be if they had implemented the five band draft system from the beginning of the regional leagues? Uh, it would be very different because there just weren't a lot of champions back in the day. So um, it's I, I liked the timing at which they introduced it and it made sense to it have it a year too earlier, maybe. Maybe they probably could have. I agree. If season two wouldn't be the time for it, but maybe in like season six or seven, you could have done it. Yeah. It, like by then you, you had enough. Even season five, potentially, because the thing is, people forget that they were releasing champions like literally every two weeks in like 2012, 2013. So they, they went from 30 champions in 2009 to like 100 pretty fast, uh, much faster. And also, than they by the now. way, I, I think the other upside, if you'd released in the past earlier, is it would have counteracted when every time on release a champion is broken and breaks pro player, like the release fucking Zoe and stuff like that. Like you could have also just easily more banned those out until they became like normal champions yeah, yeah. who were breaking the game, you know? Echo, it, all that shit. Yeah. Is it possible for baseball to break out of its death spiral? I mean, I do like the things that they're changing to the game. Like the pitch clock, I think, is a really good introduction because baseball is a game that doesn't have a finite length. It's an it's an infinite length game. So some of the stuff was like, frankly, extremely boring. Um, but, you know, some people love baseball and like baseball is in a death spiral kind of. But also like baseball is getting propped up by a lot of non-American countries like it's still super popular in Japan and Korea, um, arguably. 
I mean, Shohei Otani might be the best baseball player ever. People say he's the goal, right? And he's playing right now. So that's pretty fucking exciting if you're a baseball fan. Okay. I'm not a fan of baseball because I think it's a bad sport. I don't like sport a team sport that is 90% a 1v1 between a batter and a pitcher. I just think it's badly designed. I think it's a I, I do enjoy going to a baseball game with my friends and having a beer and sitting outside. Because baseball is a game where I have to pay attention to it once every five minutes and you get to see so it's like a nice day out. You know what I mean? But watching baseball on TV is fucking miserable. And the fact that they have so many games in the season is great if you're super into stats and like fantasy baseball, but it's pretty lame if you actually want to watch and follow a team. Monty, I know nothing about baseball, but I will say if you look up, there was one thing the other day that did make me laugh where there's a player called Matt Strom who looks identical to Nicolas Cage. Just put it in like it's Strom, <laughs> S-T-R-A-H-M. He looks okay, identical, okay. bro. Just put, in baseball, just put in baseball player Nick Cage. You'll see it's crazy how much this guy looks like Nicolas Cage. Oh my God, that is wild. It's mental, isn't it? <laughs> that is actually mental, mate. I can't be. I can't be. <laughs> That is fucking like, dude. He has to be a, like a clone, fucking bastard child. Like, there's something's <laughs> going on with that, man. That's still on the nose. Still on the nose, mate. It's so I nose. look. Who knows? But it's definitely still very popular in a variety of locations. And like, it. I think the the changes they're making in the game. It's making it so people can steal bases easier as well. Like, they're trying to increase excitement that isn't just pitcher batter interaction. Now, the downside of this is like, obviously, pitchers are being getting injured a lot more. Because they're pitching faster, so like that's something to look at. But especially a few years ago, what made me laugh, Thorin, is like I don't, I don't know if you were following the story where they had discovered that there was this sticky substance, this what they called spider tack on all of the balls. So a few years ago, they had like a couple Pretty years cheated. where it was like the lowest scoring right. era in the entire right. history of baseball. And what they found was they were like are people cheating? And like the pitchers would just like hide it in the brims of their hats. And so it was giving right. them extra grip on the ball. So they, they had this like sticky clay that yeah, they yeah. were using. And, and so MLB was like, we wonder how widespread this is. So they did an analysis on everyone. game on game balls. On. Do you know what percentage of game balls had this like on them? Or Come on. One hundred percent of them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, the players have kind of brought this on themselves. By the way, that is cheating. also something I hate about when the nephews decide to tell you, despite having never watched any other era, that this era is the best era of sports. It's because like I always think that about the NFL, Monty. You know, when they're like, look at this quarterback, ten of them are throwing 4,000 yards. Bro, the fucking gloves basically may as well be like magnetized. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it's mental. <laughs> if you see in the old days, like that's why like Dallas Clark catching with no gloves was mental. Like that guy was just yeah. fucking super skilled. Like, yeah. And also you, the reason why, Monty, it's insane that baseball's dying out is, you know, baseball like, logically, culturally has the most OP advantage of any sport in America, which oh, is yeah. little kids can play and not get injured. You can't play tackle American football or fucking MMA if you're eight. You can go as, and your mom goes, can I hit you? But you can, everyone can, so everyone does play the game to start with. So you yeah. would think if they got it right, it would still be a big sport. It's fun like, to play. It should be. Um, I think it's a fun game to play. I just think it's horrible to watch unless you're literally physically in the stadium and it doesn't really have anything to do with the game, why that's enjoyable. It's like a beer and a sunny day, a sunny summer day. Like it's pleasant. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Like baseball, it's situationally okay. I just, I'm not, I'm not a super. By the way, I will say, in the same way as I always point out for League of Legends content, you shouldn't actually make it about analysis because they're lying. No one wants that. They want entertainment. They want distraction. They want comedy, right? In the same way, this is the flaw you've got with baseball, Monty. You're treating it like it's a hardcore sport that's about excellence. No, no. Literally, it is a sport, much like football, that is in, literally, essentially, it's what you do while you drink beer. Once yes. you understand that, now design the sport so it's really entertaining while I'm drinking beer and talking also, shit. Then also, I'm going to do it, yes. You could argue that the athletes also are probably drinking too much beer, given that they just kind of, I mean, some of those guys are horribly out of shape. Like, they oh, don't even look like yeah. professional athletes. Some, like, the joke of that, like Ricky Powers or whatever that thing was, like, there are people who look like that, look at them have a beer belly. You know? also, yeah, also, baseball was way better. I'm just going to put this out there. The late 90s and early 2000s where Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds were like steroided to fuck. It was 
actually much a much better game when they were just oh, smashing there's, home runs. There's everywhere. like a mad there's a mad stat that there's a season where Sammy Sosa did some like record of like things, and he did like an amazing amount that in history would have been for. But the joke is because he did it in their era, he was like never number one for like home runs or whatever. Like that's how OP <laughs> it was back then. Exactly. <laughs> so what's meant, like, like, like when they could basically just score like <laughs> home runs multiple every game was better. Wasn't it? I don't know. Was but it was funny to shit. even just look at Mark McGuire and like Barry Buzz. You're like. That's not real. The worst one is Barry Bonds because, bro, in his, like, late 30s, his head just got bigger. It's like, bro, why is your head growing? You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? It did make the game better, though. Sure. <laughs> Uh, I get that this year's EWC was essentially a trial to see if they could run a lull tournament and to see who would show up. It's reasonable to understand why this year's EWC has no bearing on Genji's Golden Road due to the format and other circumstances. In future years, if they implement a more robust format and have more teams there, could eventually be counted redefine the Golden Road? You know, the 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 joke that people were making, Thorin, that I thought was good was that they were calling it the Rainbow Road if you also win the EWC. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just to annoy the Saudis, <laughs> which oh, I thought was very funny. Um, uh, but don't worry, guys. That's not going to, as we discussed earlier on the show, that won't be the case moving forward. MSI will just be integrated. So the answer is yes, it will count. Uh, but not but in the way think, you think. I hope everyone gets this because people are also making these spurious arguments. About the, yes, but past MSIs, you only had to win one best of five. That's not the point. The point is it's not part of the riot circuit. The Grand Slam yeah. refers to the riot circuit. By the way, you know what? I'll even offer an olive branch to, to purists. Yeah, if G2 had done it, where if they'd beaten the FPX, they'd have done the Grand Slam, I would have pointed out they, by definition, had a way easier Grand Slam because they just have to win Europe twice. Like, winning it, yep. the difference is if JDG had done it, it would be really impressive. Or if Gen G, they're the hardest right. region. So I even think there's all Grand Slams aren't created equal, too. But no, if it's officially MSI or some tournament from Riot next year, then I'm all good with it being in this fucking Grand Slam, whether it's a different format or not. It could even be the same format. It's more about the Riot status and the idea you have to compete in this one. Because remember, that's the thing people are missing, Monty. It was optional. You could actually yeah, turn down that's the what I said on Twitter. As far, as far as we know. I mean, on paper, by the way, I'll even add that in. Technically, if you're a Team Liquid or FlyQuest player, you didn't have to attend. Yep. In theory. <laughs> Conceptually. Um, there, there is a... Well, I mean, probably much more likely that you wouldn't attend as a FlyQuest player because FlyQuest isn't a partnered team with Saudi Arabia, whereas Team Liquid is a partnered team with... Saudi Arabia. So I would imagine there's a lot more pressure from Team Liquid, who is uh, more closely aligned. Um, there is a common sentiment that the LEC has dropped in quality and is entering an LCS style period of decline. What, in your opinions, could Riot do to save the product or at least prevent uh, further deterioration? The problem with what's happening with LEC is that here's my take on what happened. Because it seemed the people who were fired from LEC seemed completely arbitrary from my conversations with people and from my knowledge of who those people were. Okay. And so my what I think happened is that John, Johnny Needham, the head of esports, was like, I must cut costs, but I can't cause a panic in the ranks over in Europe. So I can't even ask people who should be fired. So he just looked at names on a spreadsheet and just crossed a few off. And like, well, oh, that hell. seems good. That's nightmare fuel. Because, because there isn't there isn't any other real explanation as to why they would have laid off the people that they did. Because in my conversations with people at LEC, they're like, this person was really actually extremely crucial to the operation of this league. And like they kept this other bum and that's really weird. You know what I mean? So it was it was a very it seemed like a very arbitrary choice made by somebody who didn't even know the operations of the LEC. And so I think until they figure out how to actually, you know, deal with the people they have left and then hire people to fill those vacancies. But they really did a very good job of gutting the LEC product um, by by doing that layoff and not because there wasn't dead late wait to lay off. It's just because they didn't fire the right people, as far as I can tell. By the way, I've got a comedic thing I can tell you about that happened during this show. So during this show, Mikhail Klementov, that guy who used to work for the Washington Post and with yeah, Jacob yeah, yeah. Wolf, etc., posted a scoop that said Riot had cancelled a second fighting game, which was codenamed Pool Party in late May, and that 70, 80 people were working on it. And it was in the vein of Smash Brothers Melee. Now, here's what you're not going to expect, guys. That's an example of a game I think is genius that Riot would copy, and here's why. Because they might have found the only game dev who are more of a prick than them. <laughs> I thought when you said the, the title, I'm even take riot games or also pool party is such a cynical fucking code name as well. I, I know. 
Tom I thought Hardy. when you said pool party, it was going to be a dead or alive uh, with bouncing fighting tits, game yeah, club with the bouncing tits. That's what I thought it no, was going to be. No, because here's the thing, Monty. Here's actually how you know. I'll do a very brief one-minute rant. Here's how you know that it is not what is presented as, that what we're doing, Monty, is it's about, like, gay acceptance and normalizing different sexualities and, you know, representation of actors. Because I'll tell you two obvious examples, Monty, that show it's not like that. You know when you watch a show like The Boys... Oh, they'll show you a man's ass, but they won't show you someone's tits. <laughs> they'll show you in a movie, they'll make like the King of England be an African actor. But I know it's Monty. They never make the Nazis in movies black. Have you noticed that? <laughs> they just seem to still be sort of like Germans being cast for those roles. So Kat, all I'm going to say is, I think you've given yourself away on that one, boys. So you give yourself away. <laughs> it's all good. You give yourself away. Um, being, but anyway, like what will save the product? Like, I, I think that... You know, they have to have good leadership. And I think that the LEC leadership, look, I, I don't think that Mark Zimmerman is a real commissioner, but I do think he's done very good things with the product of LCS. And that person doesn't exist over in LEC. Like they have had a clown parade of commissioners over there for a long time, just like there was a clown parade of commissioners at LCS for many, many years. So they need to have somebody who actually has vision. But you know what doesn't help is they fired the executive producer of LEC. <laughs> like, the joke is, Quick Shot would be the ultimate one, wouldn't yeah, he? Isn't he course. the perfect yeah, person yeah, yeah. to do the role? But he's gone now, isn't he? Yeah. Obviously, himself um, and EWC. So maybe they'll take rebel. their own lead and take, you know, somebody else who actually knows the industry, because that was the whole thing is that they just wouldn't hire endemic sure. people for the product lead roles. So if they hire Here's somebody who actually knows what the fuck they're doing, you know maybe. Even though I like Quickshot, he did do it to himself and he did massively flex many times and he did do welcome ladies and gentlemen and everyone else. So I'll just say this. The joke of Quickshot is if he went to Saudi Arabia and suddenly around a corner stepped Andrew Tate, he'd go, oh my God, get him away. And then if they took the mask off and it was MBS, he'd go, oh, thank God, phew. <laughs> I thought you were someone else for a second there. That, 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 <laughs> you did it to Albert. I didn't make you do it, so it's all good. Don't worry about it. Uh, being the best and maybe the only League of Legends and other esports show for adults, will the bet prediction segment be returning? Yeah, if we have the right sponsor for it, sure. Right I don't mind sponsor? it. It was fun, actually. I thought it was a good way to to yeah. uh, kick off conversations. We're working on that, guys. Uh, as a tournament format aficionado, what do you think of the format of the next season of UCL? What is that, Champions League? Yeah, it means the European Champions League, yeah. You're here for Champions League. Um, brief explanation of the changes. 36 teams in a league format. They are seated into four different pots based on the five-year performance of UEFA competitions. Okay, I get it. I get it. Um, right. All teams are drawn to play two matches against each pot and only have one match for each opponent. Two matches against... So you have to play two matches against your own pot? So it's like a double round robin? And only have one match for each opponent. I don't understand. Into the knockout phase, league finishes. League finishers first through eighth qualify directly to round of sixteen. Ninth through twenty fourth positions play round of thirty two. Okay, so you get you basically get a, right. a buy. That's the big change. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And many more variables. In my opinion, it looks like a great for it looks great for football elitists. I mean, it sounds good. I like the fact that they seed based off of five year performance into the different pools. That seems good. I don't really have a take on it. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know enough about soccer, but I, I mean, mean it's these formats are dog shit. Like, why can't we have a GSL group? Why can't we have a double limb? But I've learned the problem with fans is they're morons. What their logic goes is if it was like that before, it has to be like that. And they, they can't it's the, it's separate. The, it's the appeal they're, to antiquity, they, logical it, fallacy. Yeah. Reads, yeah, but what they don't get is they think when they enjoyed amazing runs, it was because of the format. It was often in yeah. spite of it, you idiots, you know. Yeah. So you don't realize you'd enjoy it even more if it was double a limb. Like, by the way, I'll give you the example. Oh, I'll give you an example. So this season, think of results like Real Madrid winning some of their games, beating Bayern Munich and some of these other teams. Like there was matches they weren't supposed to win, but they just had a really lucky run. I'd love to see that in double limb. If you could do that in double limb, even more impressive. If you can, maybe someone else deserves to win. I would like that. Here's the other thing. Like soccer is obviously the best sport to do this with because it's non-contact. Well, mostly non-contact. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can play a million matches of soccer, right? So here's one. You could do double elimination in soccer and you could do a bracket reset in soccer relatively easily because I it's could. a big enough sport. Like, would anybody, first off, the stadium will be available, but if you have to play three days from now in a bracket reset, seems like it's fine for me, right? You just play two games in the final instead of one. 
So I think you could actually feasibly do that with a sport like soccer as well. So I think there are a lot of potentially cool. By the way, I'll just say for the millionth time, shout out to Twitch engineers for inventing first time chat a comment. It just <laughs> means what is said here is totally retarded. <laughs> so we all know, we know what to just, oh, I don't need to see what he's saying. First time, first time, first time. It's all good, first time. All right, that was the last question. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, we'll be back with more domestic league conversations next week on Summoning Insight. See you guys then.